Attention, citizens of Fair Gotham, welcome to Bat Minute Beyond Chunks of the Joker, the show that really hates your guts. No, I don't really. I'm joking. I'm, I'm too nice. I can't even pretend. I couldn't be like a bad guy wrestler. I'd be awful at it. I am one of your hosts, John Parker. And uh, here is the, the, the co-host who never gets tired of this. Uh, it's me, Niall McGowan. That's not what you were telling me earlier. You're like, oh, this the show, I, I hate the show. That's where I got the idea from. You're like, these listeners, they're all chumps. <laughs> I would I would 100% go heel turn, though. And just, <laughs> come and, listen to all you listening assholes out there. I don't like you and I don't like your face. <laughs> Yeah, to be fair, the one time I did find myself in a wrestling ring, I did go heel. But uh, regardless, <laughs> we are joined by two very special guests, as is our usual uh, you know, usual thing that we do here. We are joined today by Bubba Wheat and Susan Hill. Hello. Hey. Hey, happy to be here. Hey. hey. Yeah. Two newbies to the show. Like, you, you both you folks have never appeared on uh, Batman as, as yet. Uh, and I guess like oh, I didn't realize it until like a couple of moments ago when we signed when we all like joined the call. I was like, oh, I haven't told Susan and Bubba they're coming on together. <laughs> I don't know if you two people even know each other at all. <laughs> so this, this could be this could be an interesting experiment of just like they've never been on the show before. They might never have even talked to each other. Before, well, Bubba did we'll disappear on the one armed minute. So we are familiar with each other. Yeah. Uh, OK. OK. Oh, I was hoping Niall was going to get to take credit there for like a new friendship. <laughs> <laughs> Doing the um, it's like I mock that Jesse Eisenberg, Lex Luthor, so much, but like I still quote him richly and warmly so so often as well, mm-hmm. and so I just always do that. Like I love it, I love bringing people together. See, uh, people <laughs> people insult him. There's a lot of stuff that you can remember. Mm-hmm. Oh no, as I say, like I've said it on this show many times, but like literally any time something bad is happening, I'm always I always instantly go like, boy, are we having problems up here? <laughs> like, <laughs> I was like, oh, hey, that guy made an impact. I'll give him that. But as, as much as I may want to talk about him, we're here today to talk about minutes 61 to 65. That's right, isn't it? Th- yeah. uh, which is chunk 13. <laughs> Unlucky 13, maybe? Yeah, could potentially. Mm-hmm. Potentially. I, although my understanding is that in the old days, that was actually a lucky number. And yeah, it's been I think it's one of those so things that just like changes. the. Like, I remember always having a debate with my, my own mother about the whole like black cat crossing your path thing and saying oh, yeah, like, oh yeah. that, that's bad luck and she's like no it's good luck like she was raised to believe that was good luck and then uh-huh. and that's that's within like you know within the last like couple of years it's like oh how where is she getting it's good luck from and then I, everyone else seems to be telling us bad like mm. it's all because it's all made up that's the whole <laughs> point of it though this is it's all nonsense, like what we are talking about. Uh, this chunk starts with sneaky, sneaky, and it ends with blowing a raspberry. I had to mm. pronounce that the English way to make that semi-rhyme. A, rasp, a raspberry. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you said it American, it doesn't sound quite right, you know? Yeah. Sneaky raspberry in I really English, thought that you sounds, were, you know. The fact that we end on the word fart, John, as well. It's like, I really thought you were going to go do something with that. Because, like, how often do we... I don't think we, the word fart has ever been said in any of the Batman movies we've covered so far. To, to my knowledge, and I'm sure we'll have some listener say I'm wrong, I, I believe you're right. Yeah, yeah. And I can't imagine it'll pop up in the Nolan films. <laughs> and somehow I don't think that Adam West has ever... I don't think his Batman ever uttered the word fart. So No. Well, you know what? Now you've said this... Because we've discovered, of course, throughout the the years that Christopher Nolan is a hack. He um, rips off rec- things from this very chunk. <laughs> okay, I'll get to yes, all of this. Yes, <laughs> And I think maybe we're going to discover when we get to those movies in whatever capacity, we'll discover, oh, it turns out he also says fart every other word. <laughs> well, can I jump in with a slightly related thing? In uh, no. the original 1989 Batman, Jack Nicholson does a, blows a raspberry and then propels himself forward with a fart sound. Mm. That's true. There you go. He does, he does do that, but he doesn't utter the way he doesn't, doesn't say, say he the doesn't word say fart. No, no. no. Like Jack would be too classy for that. He's, Jack seems like the guy who would do a fart in front of you and then laugh about it, but I can't imagine him saying the word for some reason. <laughs> um, but anywho, uh, 
like what, what, like uh, uh, while we you know to set the scene at the beginning of uh, the chunk. Um, how how familiar are you to uh, with Batman Beyond in general and with this film? Had it, had either of you ever seen it before? Or Bubba, I know you you've delved quite a lot in comic book stuff, so <laughs> I'm imagining you were probably well familiar with it. But like uh, Susan, like had do you uh, did you ever come across Batman Beyond at all before? This or? is the first animated Batman movie that I've ever seen. Wow! Yeah, wow. I'm I'm definitely 100 percent more of a Marvel girl. Well versed in Marvel, I collected Marvel comic books growing up. DC is a little less familiar to me. Yeah, still uh, like the the eternal struggle as well as I've just seen before uh, signing on is that like because the, as of recording, it's the opening weekend of Wolverine versus Deadpool, and then like the headlines now having to go like, oh, it's open at this. What you'll notice is significantly more money than uh, Batman versus Superman. <laughs> it's like, what are you bringing it up for? What are you bringing it up for? To generate clicks, of course. Why else would you do that? <laughs> well, yeah, well, that's the answer right there. <laughs> yeah, and, huh? and I I grew up, um, you know, I was the prime age of watching the, the uh, BTAS, the animated series. And then I like just barely aged out like i i know i watched a handful of episodes of uh, batman beyond but uh i believe it came out whenever i was starting or not necessarily growing out of cartoons because i never grew out of cartoons but the the hmm. growing out of that specific time slot i think because i think it was like the after school time slot yeah, and you start thinking to yourself, well, I'm not watching that. I'm far too adult now. <laughs> but I did watch a few episodes and then of course I've I have I ran a you know a superhero movie blog starting in twenty twelve. So I've I've watched all you know, opposite of Susan, I've watched every <laughs> animated Batman movie. <laughs> and I, I definitely watched this one and it was actually the first time that i watched it whenever i watched it for the blog uh so it was probably about maybe six or seven years ago whenever i got around to this one but uh i i really enjoyed it then and uh you know i, I think it's a a great move from the the btas era i i think it uh, generally holds up as a as a good successor mm mm I think yeah, the, the, yeah. Everything about it just makes so much sense now that everyone's like the world seems to be just sat in his hands waiting for some sort of official Batman Beyond adaptation to come along now because like that's naturally the next thing you would do is do just, just, the, the, the 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 concept still sat there it's still fresh it's still good let's go let's roll with it but uh, yeah so you know unless unless Jimmy Gunn says something uh, between now and uh, air date yeah, we just still <laughs> we're still wanna. It's in this weird nexus state of like, hey, remember Batman Beyond? Yeah, we should do something more with that, you know. But you um, know, I think the time is right to do it now. Come on, mm -hmm. people, what what are you doing? Yeah, yeah. But as a as a Marvel girly, um, Susan, like, what was your? Did you sit and scoff the whole way through this, or did you enjoy it? <laughs> by the time it was over? Well, I was certainly aware that Mark Hamill was very well known for voicing the Joker, uh, but I'd never mm. actually you know witnessed it myself. And oh wow, um, holy moly! I, I was as dark as this movie is, and it covers some very <laughs> horrific things. Um, I yep. did enjoy it. The the you know the hour and ten minutes or however long it is went by pretty quick. Yeah, I was, was kind of hoping there for a second that you were going to be the the first person <laughs> ever <laughs> to be like oh, I heard about this Mark Hamill guy voicing the Joker and that he's supposed to be really good, and I watched him and he stunk. <laughs> I thought he was terrible. <laughs> Uh, he's certainly a better actor than this than he is in Star Wars. And don't get me wrong, I love Star Wars. But, you know, he was very young at the time and inexperienced. Like, voice acting is, I think, where Mark Hamill really shines. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And he's I a... think this one, I mean, maybe I'm an idiot for thinking this. I don't know. To me, I think this one feels a little bit closer, despite the darkness. But everything else about it feels a bit more marvelly to me. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, yeah, like the way good. we've talked about how Terry's basically, he's basically like a Spider-Man kind of character. Yeah, <laughs> he, is, he is just basically Spider-Man. Spider-Man in, uh, in with Spider-Man with ears, basically. Is the, yeah, is the yeah it, even though it's not in this chunk, it, it really starts in the, like the, the next chunk or the one after. But he, he kind of ends up defeating the Joker by going full Spider-Man. Yeah. 
One hundred percent. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. It's sort of like he, he he weaponizes monologuing right <laughs> at the end of the movie, <laughs> and I'm just thinking Genius. about uh, Civil War, uh, Avengers Civil War, where I don't know, Captain America Civil War, where um, uh, Spider Man is all like, you know, yo, you ever see that old movie, in The Empire Strikes Back? You know, he's just like <laughs> taking his movie experience and taking it into the real world. <laughs> but uh, th- this chunk uh, That's does... what I imagine though like you ever hear that really old villain the Riddler and like he's not that old he's younger than me what are you talking about how dare you say that about him <laughs> no this chunk though does start with um, you know Bruce overseeing Terry's invasion of Joker's Candyland mm. and Terry uh, he finds <gasps> Tim Drake unconscious yeah but alive and- I have to say, though, I just uh, as much as I have been frequently poo-pooing the overuse of the Joker in um, in media, uh, particularly in the comics, because it's just like it's all the time. And then like now it's like he's got his own franchise for God's sake with Joaquin Phoenix, and like it's just like let's just give the character a rest already. <laughs> I do have to say there is always a little chill when you get like a third act finale set up. And someone says something like Bruce says here. Now it's like, well, keep your eyes out for the Joker. Like there's yeah. always that kind of thing of like, we're getting down to brass tacks. It's Batman versus the Joker. Like <laughs> it's always got a kind of like people really laid into uh, the Arkham Origins game when it uh, it came out because they would like they made it look as if Black Mask was going to be the villain of it. And then oh, halfway yeah. through, it re- was revealed the Black Mask was actually the Joker <laughs> in disguise. And the Joker was once again the main villain. And I didn't mind that twist. And uh, I remember distinctly at the end, though, when you're set up to go back into Blackgate and it has like the little mission objective. And it was just like mission objective, defeat the Joker. It was just like, that, oh, it just gives you a little a little <laughs> buzz because yeah. you're like, it's like, oh, that's such a classic thing with Batman going to take on the Joker. So yeah, I, love the, yeah. I love the silence here of Terry stepping around and then Joker, like, Bruce having to be like, keep an eye out for the Joker. Because uh, you're setting up to like how dangerous the guy is and how much yeah. a, how much of a, a climactic of, thing this is going to be. And it's a way of him having that moment you've just talked about, even though he can't physically be there. He's yeah. still he's experiencing it again. Yeah. He's um, so yeah, bat, bat <laughs> backseat Batmaning is uh, <laughs> is Bruce's whole Emma. It only occurred to me too that because we always talked about um, you know, this is Terry essentially becoming the Batman. Uh, and like it only really dawned on me like every time he's on comms with them Bruce is constantly calling him Terry uh, whereas you know when Bruce is in his and apparently in his own mind even as an old man he refers to himself as Batman and <laughs> well, when he's out in the field Batman, always a Batman you know well yeah but when he's out in the field he's always calling Robin Robin he would never call them Dick or anything like that he was always like yeah, Robin Batgirl etc cetera, etc cetera. and then it almost feels like it's a little bit of undermining Terry that he's he never says to him Batman look out for the Joker he's always Terry like, you're not, yeah, you, kid, you look out for the joke. Guy with my outfit on. Like, <laughs> he's not giving him the due respect. It almost feels like at the end they should, they should have a little moment of uh, Bruce referring to him as Batman uh, over yeah. comms to be like, as he's talking to him. And, well, this uh, is the film where he earns the title. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. yeah. By the end, it's sort of a feel. Bruce's end, mind if no like one else's. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, yeah, there's a little bit of a nice little moment because it does feel very, like, I guess maybe the excuse for that would be like, well, he has to call Robin Robin out in the field because he can't call him Dick because everyone would be like, why is he calling Robin Dick the whole everyone time? Would just, <laughs> everyone would just giggle, right? <laughs> where, where do you go from there? <laughs> and they'd it's be like, all like, oh, that Batman's a real jerk to his mother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he really hates that kid. <laughs> yeah, Bruce, Bruce has to call him Terry instead of Batman because if he's calling him Batman, he'll think that he's talking to himself. Oh, <laughs> oh that'll mess with his head even more. He's already got enough mental health problems. Yeah, the mental health issues in this movie are like, Far-reaching. <laughs> uh, yeah. no, we'll, get, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. <laughs> well, so, someone who is suffering from mental health issues here, you know, you've got uh, you've got Tim. I love right, how bloody aggressive and rude Terry is to Tim, though. Mm. Like, he's right about him and stuff, but he doesn't even know at this point that he's right. No, marvelous. No. He's just a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> well, he thinks he thinks little... right that that. Uh, Tim is working with the Joker. He does has no idea that he's about mm-hmm. to morph into the Joker, right? Yeah. To be yeah. fair, what actually happens? I don't think anybody would have predicted really. No. Like what occurs? You'd be like, no, no, that's yeah. the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Yeah, I, I, I did go back and reread my my uh, old review of this movie, and that was one of my big issues. Was you know, I I think this is a fantastic movie, but the out of nowhere. 
third act twist kind of ruin <laughs> not ruins it but it's a, it kind of hurts the overall movie for me yeah, it takes you out like, right I, you're just like what the what <laughs> how what <laughs> Yeah, there, there's oh, like no I, way I, I, I could have guessed this <laughs> this as a possible you know mysteries you're supposed they're supposed to like sprinkle clues throughout and then yeah. once you watch it one time and then you see you find out who the killer is you watch it again and you see oh yeah i can see the clues sprinkled out but this one it's like no mm. it's just out, completely out of nowhere there's no way you can figure <laughs> and guess this one out we 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 have covered it chunk by chunk, so maybe we're looking at it a bit more strenuously. But like our little things, like the Jack in the Box of a Robin with a bomb in his head, was kind of taken like, oh, that's a little foreshadowing. Uh, the whole thing with the Robin suit in the Batcave, but also the fact you get Tim Drake dressed up as the Joker earlier in the movies. It's like oh, there's, 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 I, there's signals there. There's, yeah. I see both sides to that. I think what the, what would solve that as an issue is if he didn't literally physically transform. Yeah. Mm. If it was more yeah. a mental thing, you know, like um, maybe you haven't actually seen the Joker at this point. You've heard him yeah. and things like that. I, I would even because like go then for you could buy it. like if if the the Joker didn't actually physically interact with anybody, and then it was the hologram that they showed earlier in the movie. Yes, there you go. Because then you'd be like, okay, he's in his head in a literal sense, but I think physically turning into the Joker might be too much for some That's people. where it jumps the shark for me, I think. It, if, if he just, like, smeared paint across his face, you know, or something oh, like that, yeah. okay, I'd buy it. Because to me, I mean, I watched this movie for the first time last night, literally, so to me, it, it was a journey through PTSD, right? Robin was mm -hmm. abused and tortured and manipulated as a, as a youth, which is a whole problem on its own, but uh and then so you think he's suffering from ptsd the whole time so he's like got stockholm syndrome of some kind and he's joined with the joker when he actually physically transforms into the joker it's like we've we've gone from batman comic to sci-fi like when did we make that leap and how did we earn that leap? Yeah, we are in the future there are flying cars we're doing we're doing the whole thing that's like plus batman's a, a hero who has a guy made out of clay who can shapeshift and stuff like i well, yeah. i didn't bump into the him turning into, it it's ridiculous in that like come on no <laughs> but also i was like no I'm, I'm fine with that as being like the the big reveal that like no he was literally the joker the whole time and plus, as you're saying, Susan, like it kind of uh, thematically then it goes from Stockholm Syndrome into like uh, how, you know, hurt people hurt people like the abuser, the abused can become the abuser. Yeah. And like some people who might have been like raised by like an abusive alcoholic will become abusive alcoholics later in life. Like so mm -hmm. Tim literally becoming the Joker, you know, with all this past trauma that's been repressed in him and stuff is like. That all tracked to me. I thought that was a, you know. That part tracks um, me. It's the physical transformation that I don't buy. You know yeah, what? Despite yeah. me bringing it up, I'm going to defend it at the same time. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm, the fen I'm a fence sitter. I'm a fence sitter, right? <laughs> I'm going to say we could view it. Get I don't those think splinters they... out of your ass, Parker. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they mean it in this way, but we could view it. Uh, as I always bring up on this show, through a kind of Lynchian lens, right? It could be like in um, in Lost Highway. It could be more like, yes, it's literally happening in the movie, but we're meant to view it as a kind of metaphor. Oh, boy. I don't know, though, because <laughs> <laughs> Terry and Bruce's reaction is pretty much like, he literally just changed into a different yeah, guy yeah, right in front it's of us. The, it's the way it does it in Lost Highway. He literally transforms, but it, it, it's not literal in the sense that it is in other films, you know? Mm. It's, I um, think in Lost it's Highway, it is, it is also quite literal that he is literally transforming <laughs> Yeah, himself. yeah. But it, 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 thematically, it's about other things, you know? So yeah. maybe that's what they're going... Uh, probably not, but you never know. Yeah. Um, before we get to the transformation, though, because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the part we all want to get to do. Um, <laughs> there's a little bit there with, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Terry's very aggressive interrogation. I guess he's been paying attention to Bruce, <laughs> where he's just like, I suspect you, so it means you're 100% guilty, <laughs> dickhead. Where, where's the Joker, asshole? Don't make me fucking... Uh, that's true. That's Bruce's whole move, I suppose. Well, it's always yep. been Batman's yep. move. It's always been dangle someone over a building until they tell you what, they, what you want to know, right? Smash their jaw to pieces yeah. and then go, now talk! <laughs> Which again, the, uh, the flashback earlier, too, was like when Barbara was like, yeah, he went looking for Tim Drake for three weeks and he was just like throwing people through windows and stuff. <laughs> 
did it work? No, Joker just had to tell him where he was. <laughs> he didn't get any info out of anybody. <laughs> it felt to me like he was being rude. And then, you know, because maybe, again, I don't mean this in a literal sense, uh, but it's it's a bit like, you know, the new partner meeting the ex. Mm. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, screw you. <laughs> I, I, it only occurred to me, too, that I don't think um, Bruce has seen Tim. So when, when Bruce goes, Tim, when he sees him on the floor, oh, yeah. this might be the first time he's seen him so in like, like 30 years or something. Oh, Tim. yeah, no, I totally get that vibe. I imagine Tim completely and utterly removed himself in every way. Yeah. I believe that. Oh, also, and Bruce would be like, no, I'm not going to. No, I believe that Tim removed himself in every way, but I cannot believe for a moment that Bruce hasn't been stalking him since then. Oh, that's Uh, true. He's a little weird. He's a little bit obsessive about (laughs) (laughs) Mm, him. He is a a prime moper as well, though. So it'd be like, no, I'm not been Batman anymore. Fine. I'm just going to know everything. Shut off the cave. No, I'm not looking at the TV. I'm just going to sit, stare at the wall. No, I'm not going to be Batman. (laughs) I'm not going to do anything. Like, he'd just be. He'd just be really mopey about it the whole time and yeah. stuff. Uh, he'd be like, no, if Tim just wants to talk to me, I don't want to talk to him. That's fine. That's totally fine. <laughs> I find one thing Tim says very funny as well, because he goes, you know, when they're talking to each other, he says, I don't do this anymore. Mm. And I'm sitting here thinking, well, except for the fact that you've literally been found in his base in a lab coat. You're doing <laughs> something, man. Yeah. Again, yeah, the whole thing you got here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, okay, maybe he's like, you know, I, I can't explain why I'm here. Fair enough. But he's like, nah, nah, I don't do that. Like, well, you, why are you here then? <laughs> <laughs> you may find yourself working in a Joker lair. <laughs> you may find yourself, and you may ask yourself, well, how did I get here? Now I want to see the Joker in a David Byrne uh, cut suit. <laughs> I'm sure some fan has made that as art. Oh, that'd be just, that'd be, uh, might explain the physical transformation, too, of his Tim Drake outfit <laughs> was a giant David Byrne suit that he steps out of. <laughs> Incredible. And we're like, Imagine oh, now it, it makes purple. more sense. Oh. <laughs> oh, I'm still getting over, like, I might still imagine, like, Bruce looking through Terry's eyes, been like, who's that? <laughs> like, that's, that's, that's Tim Drake. Like, that's Tim Drake. Who's that old guy? <laughs> Christ, that kid himself go. <laughs> who's that old guy? It's like, Bruce, have you looked in the mirror? You're old, too. Oh, <laughs> Bruce still looks good, damn it. <laughs> He's still got the bod. Yeah, yeah the Maybe shoulder's like, oh, wide he's... enough that you have to turn sideways to go through the door. <laughs> <laughs> but like, you know, he always did have bushy eyebrows as a kid. <laughs> he tracks that he'd have them as an adult, too. I think that would be the most disturbing sight to me, a bushy eyebrowed child. Mm. Oh, dear Lord. <laughs> yeah, nightmares. that's unsettling. <laughs> <laughs> it's like flying a kite at night. It's wrong. Uh, <laughs> so that, actually made it, that reminds me of that Simpsons thing of like... You know, something about flying a kite at night is so unwholesome. <laughs> in making my notes, when it got to, like, Terry's mum swinging Maddie, I was like, so something about swinging a kid at night that's so... Like, what is it? It's not supposed to be, like, 11 p.m.? What the hell are they doing out there? Yeah, yeah. It's it's not right, that. That's, there's something off. Yeah, that that swing ain't right. <laughs> um, yeah, but... Uh, yeah, I guess maybe Terry's... Just, or uh, Tim's more like... Mentioning the Joker is more of like, oh no, I have no involvement in any of that anymore. Like, but then, yeah, it's hard to tell like what they were thinking in terms of when the Joker is in charge and when he's not. Because yeah. well, even in making my notes, I was like, oh, this is like the end of Saw, where like, oh, the body in the corner, but that was the Joker the whole time. You know, like it's gonna be the, the big reveal. Like the, the guy you thought was harmless actually was the Joker. But then when Bruce. Well, Bruce via Terry is scanning his vitals or whatever and his mm-hmm. pulse. And he's like, well, no, he's, he's telling the truth, which it would indicate that at this point, Tim isn't been controlled by the Joker. It's not well, a that's fake what out. I thought as well, because there's a bit where, you know, he remembers that he killed him. Yeah. And, he, you know, he seems to feel responsible. He feels bad. And I thought, like, is that genuine there? Mm. And it ties into what you're saying, because... My initial thought was, yeah, of course it is because of what Bruce says, but I don't know. I I, I was wondering if the um, if him remembering killing him is the is the thing that triggers him every time. Like that's a repressed memory, and then when the Joker wants to come out, he forces that forward, and he's just like, oh my god, I killed the Joker, and then that sort of that that that's the beginning of the uh, you uh. know the, the the launch into Joker the Joker transformation. And well, stuff. it's a very common yeah, that, thing. That's kind of where I yeah. Yeah, that, that's kind of where I thought it was, at least in this scene. I, I don't know about every single time, but I was trying to figure out when the switchover happened. 
And I do mm. think that that, that kind of uh, traumatic moment where he starts uh, holding his head is like right around when the switch happens. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Well, the Joker says later yeah. on in, in this chunk that um, he isn't strong enough to have permanent control yet. So I wonder if he prompts these memories as a way, as like a window for him to get out. Yeah. Because yeah. it's a common thing in, uh, in comic books where like the, when the, when the, you know, when, in the origin stories, when the person first gets their powers and they have to find what the trigger is for their power because they can't do it on purpose for the first little while. So I think it's like, this mm. is the trigger that lets the Joker out and he, it, yeah. me get, it seems to be getting easier and easier and he takes more and more control and until he had point where he actually makes a physical transformation. Oh, I love that idea. Yeah, I, think I also great. think it's interesting that, like, whenever he's talking about it, and he picks up the the Jokerized teddy bear with the sharp teeth. Yeah, with and the just jaws. Absent, yeah, and just <laughs> kind of absent-mindedly plays with it. It's like jump, jump, mm. jump, jump. <laughs> but then that also indicates almost that this this is the Joker faking out, though, by the fact he's just idly picking up this like razor-sharp tooth of teddy bear yeah. and isn't like, what the hell is this? Like he's just very like casually like, yeah, look, and you pull the arm. He like he knows to pull the arm to make the the, the jaws go. So it's it's Whoa. you know it's. it's I'm still am a bit like, yeah, when, as you were saying, John, like, it's like, oh, you're in the lab working there. So surely you you are part of all this. But then it seems like, no, he's not. So it's just like, how, yeah, at what point is he Tim? At what point is he the Joker? I, I like it? the idea that we don't know, though, because I mean, to, to reference, as I always do, David Lynch again, um, you know, uh, spoiler alert for Twin Peaks, people, Leland Palmer, mm -hmm. you know, because that's a that's a discussion in the show, isn't it? Of like, well. Was he in control of his actions or was it the thing yeah, yeah. within him? Is this the evil that clowns do? <laughs> it's They're so weird, evil. too, that like when you're watching, when you watch, like, again, any spoilers for Twin Peaks, but like when it's Leland's funeral and everyone's sitting around going, like, that poor man. And they don't know that he was possessed by like an extra dimensional no. demon. <laughs> and you're like, <laughs> do you just find out this guy, like, like abused and murdered his daughter what the hell are you talking about that <laughs> poor man <laughs> yeah it's it's straight i think it's just to show that like they, they are almost in denial you know it's mm. like they don't want to believe that about him they they want to just have, yeah. remember the good memories and things yeah um and i i like the idea that maybe this is similar like we don't know maybe the joker's actually been controlling him you know like deep deep within mm. a lot of the time Maybe I mean, he's controlling him right now. Yeah, oh, that, that, a lot of me thinks that he is controlling him right now, and it's just like it just needs—he just needs to build up to the physical transformation. Mm. Yeah, because um, he—you know—he uh, mentions that the microchip is buried in his subconscious, so the the Joker is always there in his subconscious. I mean, I, I think it's—I yeah. I feel like it's uh, intentional that you brought me on for this this chunk because this this feels mm. very much like the the Tyler Durden reveal of Fight Club. Mm. This uh, very. you're very perceptive. <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly the rationale for bringing you on for this this particular bit. Because don't give away the secrets. This uh yeah, this, it's 100 percent like it's so weird because this. Like this is two thousand. Fight Club's just out in ninety nine. Like it's such a similar. There's a whole big thing too. I wanted to get into about like uh, the millennium turn of the Joker, and what he's now become as a character, and how he's merged with the Tyler Durden of it all. And it's so weird that it's all come out in the last like twenty five years or so. Where like he used to be, you know, clown prince of crime. He's obviously went through various iterations and whatnot. But now we're at the stage of like, yeah, he's getting the Joker has his own movie franchise, wherein he is like a bizarre folk hero to the disenfranchised and the people looking to strike out against like the corruption in society and like, you know, how the, the rich are all assholes, et cetera, et cetera. And he's getting his own musical sequel. And that's spawned from a version of the Joker that was in The Dark Knight that was like very Tyler Durden ish in his mm. philosophy. Uh, and the fact that even in the concept art for the Joker, that when they before the film was even in production, the kind of outfits they had him in were very Tyler Durden looking, and it's all and coming back back then to this, where like oh the return of the Joker, and the reveal is essentially the same as Fight Club, where it's like yeah this yeah. guy who thought he was a complete innocent turns out he was being controlled by the Joker the whole time, and they were in fact the same actual dude, 
And it's uh, it's just a fascinating the, the development that the, you know what this film in its own little weird way, despite it not being all that like it's well known, but it's not that well known. Uh, yeah, it's and, not and like the, fact, the Dark Knight. I, I think the fact that the that they're my like the the two personalities kind of have some interaction with each other because in in this one, you know, we get the reveal that joker is actually a technical genius because he was able to create this this microchip uh by himself through stolen technology and then tim yeah. is also kind of working as uh you know with electronics himself which that was mm. wasn't necessarily something that was in his character as robin so looking at this as as a whole you wonder how much of his technical experience is actually uh seeping in through his subconscious of the the joker you know quote unquote dna that'd be something then like after you get like at the end of the movie after tim gets out of hospital he goes back to work on satellites or whatever and he's like i have no idea what i'm doing anymore <laughs> well, it's like the <laughs> matrix the right joker. like i know kung fu because i had it downloaded into my head yeah yeah he's like no that was the, the, the joker was the guy who built all that <laughs> i was like i have a goddamn clue what i'm doing like and then the joker in tim drake's subconscious is like Oh boy, this is, this this twelve hour a day job is really killing me. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's also yeah. like the the two personalities they they have like a one way connection too. Like uh, because Tim the Tim Drake personality has no idea what the Joker personality is doing whenever he comes out, but the Joker personality knows everything about Tim Drake's life. Yes, yeah. he knows everything he's getting up to. It's the same thing as like um, it's always a matter I kind of found. I think we might have talked about when I was on Fight Club Minute is like, so when Tim is taken over by the Joker, everything, he thinks it's all bad dreams and stuff like that. And yet in Fight Club, you always get the like, the beginning of Tyler Durden happened, pr- presumably when uh, the, like, the narrator, Ed Norton's character, was going through the big states of insomnia and stuff. And so he's feeling exhausted all the time. Yeah, uh, I was and, like, and there's it's even so weird, a, though, a be, line like, in in that movie that I that I caught. I don't remember if I talked about it um, and during that scene on the podcast. But he says, you know, I what about narcolepsy? You know, I fall asleep, I wake up in strange places. Like even that yeah. early in the movie, they're they're kind of setting up that he's falling asleep, turning into Tyler Durden, going out and doing mm. stuff, and then he's waking up as the Jack personality in strange places, not knowing how he got there. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's the insomnia kind of adds a bit of confusion to it because that feels like, well, if he's wide awake the entire time, when will he have time to be Tyler? The, the implication would be like, oh, yeah, he's like he thinks he's wide awake, but he's actually like the reason he's exhausted is because Tyler's been out doing stuff, and he comes back and like, man, I didn't get a like, I didn't get a wink of sleep last night. <laughs> uh, but if, if it had just been narcolepsy he had, it would have been like, oh, of course, yeah, like that's been, that's clearly what's been happening is that he's he just conks out all the time uh, and then wakes up, you know. In a, a a black symbiote suit dangling, you know, upside down from a, <laughs> the, the, a building in New York or whatever. But um, it's a uh, yeah. But so I'm also now thinking too, like, what would have, would people prefer it in Fight Club if Ed Norton then physically transformed into <laughs> Brad Pitt in some <laughs> way? Because that would, that would that would be something that might have lost the audience. I think if they were like definitely would. <laughs> well, I mean, it works here. I mean, well, I will say depending. <laughs> I will say that that seems to be at least somewhat implied or uh, hinted at in the uh, Fight Club Two graphic novel because that um, in that the you know the Tyler Durden comes back like ten ten or fifteen years later. Tyler's revenge (laughs) and there are several moments where whenever he switches from Jack to Tyler Durden you know the the art style of course changes so that the reader knows but there also seems to be you know everybody in the scene knows uh, as everyone in the story knows that the change happened as well yeah yeah it's um because yeah otherwise like I guess it's it's a nice implication in Fight Club is that like, oh, of course, you know, Brad Pitt, this, you know, hunky, chiseled out of marble dude who's just like so carefree and whatnot. Of course, he could uh, like win over all these people and start his own sort of weird cult. Um, but like, you know, but Ed Norton's so unassuming looking. But then to be in there like, no, if you just have the Tyler personality, if you have that sort of belief in yourself, 
that you that you if you believe you look like Brad Pitt when you're doing things, you can also be a Tyler <laughs> Durden, I guess. Which is kind of like a weird like, oh, you just have to have the self confidence in yourself, man. Oh, oh, that's why I always get mistaken for Brad Pitt. <laughs> <laughs> of course, though, though you you might have got into it as well, uh, Bubba. Like, there's there's a big fan theory going around that uh, Fight Club's in fact a prequel to The Dark Knight. Um, and in fact, the Joker is Tyler Durden in that film. <laughs> I actually, um, hadn't heard that's like, that. That's a, that's a whole big thing because you know the uh, obviously, obviously you know, <laughs> but like um, throughout the throughout the Dark Knight, like he's always doing like, oh, you want to know how I got these scars? Uh, he's just, yeah, his whole cheeks have been ripped open and stuff. And um, the the theory is like that's from when he shot himself in Fight Club, like to, to eliminate the Tyler Durden part. Uh, and at the end, when you what you think is the, the you know Ed Norton still in there, it's like no, no, it's just like that's the the Tyler part's there, ready to take over. And then once he gets out, you know, or, or is it like once it, once he once he's released, then he's got you know might as well go full tilt, lean into it. It's, it's all Tyler all the time. Why he was in you know go from hunky Brad Pitt to looking like a derelict clown is uh, is anyone's guess because. <laughs> Yeah, you know, the Heath Ledger Joker is so dingy looking, like he's so greasy and he looks like a bum and stuff. But um, you know, maybe he thinks it's cool surfer hair or whatever. He's like, yeah, you, you know, that's that's the uh, as we covered in um, our review of uh, Young Einstein, John. Oh, the re- reason incredible. Uh, Yahoo Sirius has that big massive hair. It's like, oh, that's Australian surfer hair. You just don't comb it or see to it at all ever. And it's like a cool thing over there to, to have this big, massive bush of hair. And then, like, yeah, the, the Tyler Durden went on to think, like, yeah, but I just don't wash my hair. I look like a cool surfer dude. And it's like, you look like a bum. Joker. Joker Durden. <laughs> Joker Durden. That's, that's a good ring to it, though. No, but you see, though, what, what, what I mean, like, in the fact that, like, you know, it's such, it's actually a very small amount of time, 1999 to 2008. And, of course, you have these two figures emerging in pop culture that have the same kind of thing because obviously Fight Club then went on to have this unfortunate sort of link with toxic masculinity and the kind of like what would Tyler Durden do of it all and some people who didn't understand the film but at the, you know, at the end of the film he's supposed to be a bad guy <laughs> like he's going way way too far with it and then also after Heath Ledger's Joker came out people's reaction to that was like that Joker guy is making a lot of sense you know and then people started making the memes of him and then that just became that became the Joaquin Phoenix Joker. Like that that his version of the character is almost like a reaction to the internet memes about Heath Ledger's Joker. It's like let's just make a movie about that where he's yeah you know he's like oh when the nice guy uh, turns the devil shivers and all that kind of all that kind of crap that they were doing back in the day. Maybe Black and white photos of him smoking thing. and stuff. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that's um. It's, yeah, I just find it so fascinating that, like, yeah, these two, these two characters have kind of a mind. And in, like, Project Mayhem, there's the whole thing of, like, yeah, you know, attacking office buildings and drawing smiley faces on them and stuff like that pops up in the film. It's like, uh, and yeah, and the fact then it comes around around the time of this, <laughs> this thing as well, where it's the same. Um, I was trying to uh, decipher... Because no offense to, uh, you know, Chuck Palahniuk, but um, <laughs> the, the the twist of the guy actually doesn't exist. And it's been, he's been in the other guy's mind the whole time. Uh, isn't exclusive to Fight Club <laughs> at all. Um, I was trying to track it back to its origin. Uh, I don't know, Bubba, though, if you had any luck with that, like in your own research during the during your own show or anything. No, I, I didn't dig into that. So, you know, I know of a few of... Uh, um, maybe not like the same person, but I've I've definitely know of a lot of imaginary characters in yeah. movies and, and stuff. It's like it's oh, it's yeah. become yeah. so much of a trope now. It's just like the like the boys just did it. It's now synonymous. It's kind of like oh yeah, Brendan Fraser and Scrubs in that one episode. <laughs> I think <laughs> the boys gets away with it because it's doing it. You know, it's it, it's a comedy essentially. But I don't think you can pull it off seriously anymore for for a while. There's got to be a break mm. on this. Yeah. Although Susan, do you remember any like? Could you try? What would be like the earliest? Although I feel bad now since you have us out there going like I didn't know that Ed Norton was Brad Pitt in Fight Club. I never saw the movie. I saw Fight Club once a long time ago. Um, I was thinking, well, at the moment I was thinking of Gollum from The Two Towers. Oh, uh, but yeah. both characters are aware of each other, unlike Tim and the Joker. 
Yeah. But I mean, yeah. I never would have thought of that one though. That's interesting. Yeah, because hmm. they have a conversation. They never. literally have a conversation with each other at one point. <laughs> That's one of the best bits yeah. in the movie yeah. as well, where it's in the reflection and stuff exactly. as well. Exactly. Like the water. <laughs> that one. <laughs> uh, the earliest one I can think of with an imaginary character that turns out to sort of be real is a Jimmy Stewart movie called Harvey. Uh, mm-hmm. It's an old black and white movie where he that. has an imaginary six foot friend, uh, six foot rabbit, six foot white rabbit that no one else can see but him. So, oh. like, they spend the entire movie trying to get him committed so that his, I think his sister or somebody, or I can't remember who it was, is to get his money. Uh, but in the end, like, you see the door open and close by itself. And, like, you know, so, like, Harvey actually does exist. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. that's interesting. I, I need to see this. Yeah, it's a oh, good, it's, it's it's a good a movie. movie. It yeah, is. I've seen it before. <laughs> it's fantastic. Yep. Oh, so then at the end of that film, Jimmy Stewart just starts like growing ears and stuff, and he t- he turns into Harvey. And <laughs> no. like, oh my God. I think this was in like the probably the late forties. I can't remember when Harvey came out, so that was a little <laughs> avant garde for those days. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I'd be the, the David Cronenberg remake. We'll be like, what if yeah. he turned into the rabbit yeah. and then goes on a killing spree? Of- like, no, no, that's not the point of the movie. <laughs> uh, the, the, the earliest I can think of that being like, because again, you have things like in. Um, like I say, for example, that episode of Scrubs, where it's like, oh yeah, Doctor Cox is talking to Brendan Fraser the whole time, but it turns out Brendan Fraser died. And it's been, oh no, it's all in his head and stuff. But like, that's not a person that anyone else is interacting with. Like the kind of thing a Fight Club was like. No, Tyler Durden was a presence in the world. The people were interacting with. He just didn't realize that it was him that he was yeah. that people were interacting with. Um, the closest I can get to it as a an origin point in film, at least is uh in uh psycho i guess like alfred hitchcock hitchcock psycho because mm-hmm. everything about you know uh mrs bates is like oh yeah she's out there influencing the world she's the one killing people but and then norman's having to go oh my god mother no having to go out and clean up what his mom's done but it turns out it was him who did it the whole damn time you know so oh you've uh, ruined the movie spoilers <laughs> i did that <laughs> <laughs> I did do that once. Like one time, there was a um, at the, in Liverpool. There's the bombed out church, which is a church that was bo- it survived a bombing in uh, World War Two, and um, they have film screenings there sometimes. Oh, and I love standing, it when they show movies there. It's great, isn't it? And I uh, sat outside for, like for ages with my and then my friend Ross, who I'm, like I don't see all that often, but like you just assume everybody knows the Twisted Psycho. And then I was just like, oh, but I can't remember why why I mentioned it, but just been like, oh, yeah, Anthony Perkins running and in the end dressed up as his mom and stuff. And he was just like, what? And I was like, yeah, it was, you know, he's Mrs. he is Mrs. Bates. <laughs> and he was like, I don't oh, know that. No. But it was literally about to watch the film in five minutes time. So. <laughs> <laughs> you should. That's when you go. Nah, I'm just I'm just, you know, I'm just uh, playing with you. That, that, that doesn't happen. Don't be stupid. <laughs> Apparently, though, the uh, uh, mutual friend, mutual friend, and uh, ex, you know, well, previous guest of the show, Gary Gavigan, he always says credits his sister for doing that because when the Sixth Sense came out, mm. like obviously, he before he saw it, he caught wind that like, no, Bruce Willis is a ghost in it, uh, and he said that to his sister who has in it, and she was like, no, what, what are you talking about? No, he's not. And he's like, well, what? what? I thought that was a twist. No, it's not the twist at all. What are you talking about? And then when he watched it, he was genuinely surprised. Like, oh, no, he was a ghost. Oh, wow. So he's like, fair play to her. She did that very deftly. You know, she managed to save, save the film for him. It's great. Yeah. I, I always try and do it. I'm not a good liar, but when it comes to something like that, I can pull it off usually. <laughs> I can bluff my way. I can convince people I haven't ruined the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I think that we've ruined about seven movies now <laughs> for people who have sat there. I was like, oh, I can't wait to finally get around to watching Harvey. <laughs> oh, God damn it. <laughs> I think at this point, at this the point, all the movies we've mentioned. The statute of limitations has passed. <laughs> exactly. And I'm, I'm a spoiler hater, but come on. Especially Psycho. <laughs> yeah, I had a friend who was waiting in line to see um, The Force Awakens and people on the way out of the movie were like, I can't believe Han Solo died. Oh, see now that that's that, so like that, you, that, you yeah. need the beatings, which you need. <laughs> I have a policy. Niall's probably witness to this. I imagine I won't talk about the movie in the lobby or anything. No. I won't. I won't talk about it at all until we've left the yeah, building. Yeah, in the parking lot, like or in the, the car, corner. or in the bus, or wherever. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah, it's not yeah. it's not fair to no, people, it's not. you know. Because I've got a lot to say, and so does Niall. <laughs> and all the people, you know. So uh, let me talk about the yeah, ending but... of Deadpool and Wolverine. <laughs> 
<laughs> I actually, as of recording, have not seen that. I know, I know you have, Niall, so no, sure. Yeah. That's, the thing, that's not even like the ending. It's just like, oh, every scene is a big, like, hey, it's a thing, you know? It's like, oh, man, I didn't know that going in. But, oh, but, um, but yeah, yeah, so we, we then get the... Um, well, I've got a couple of notes here on, like, we touched on a couple of weeks ago about the concept of... Uh, the Joker having children and whatnot when he was trying to make mm. Joker Jr. with Tim Drake, which spawns this entire segment of the film. Um, would his but, semen be viable after the chemical bath? Ooh, what color would it be? Oh, well, well, you know. I guess it's only affecting him on the outside. Uh, no, I'm, just, you know, I'm just imagining that it's purple and I'm not going to be able to unsee that. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine some people are into it. <laughs> Well, you know, Harley, you know, she definitely is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I just imagine, the, you know, his little swimmers have all perished. Yeah, I guess I suppose it's not radioactive, the thing he's going into. It's just like a, a random... But yeah, it would make... Uh, maybe that's why he, he had to fake it out with... Uh, he didn't want to admit that he was sterile to uh, Harley. <laughs> yeah. So he had to like... He sort of kind of gaslit her into into believing she didn't want to give birth. Like she was totally into the idea of having kids, like in a traditional manner. And he's no, no, you should uh, we should adopt. You don't want I've to go through all that. To adoption. Because <laughs> <laughs> the Joker would be the type of he would have the level of ego where he couldn't admit to someone that he was sterile. Like I yeah, have a, yeah. I have a feeling like he could have just been. Like he didn't need to put in the effort to transform himself in, like to change his body into his body, like to turn Term Drake literally into him. But I think it's an ego thing where he's like, no, he has to have the white skin and the green hair. He has to look exactly like me because that's, you know, I'm great. And why wouldn't I want that? Well, it's not like, just I'm that. Not he, he needs to be that for Batman. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, because that'll, that'll get to Batman and like another layer of getting to him on top of the fact that you've corrupted his child essentially because <laughs> um, part of his victory but, against batman here is that he's survived and the other part is that he's taken over tim right yeah, it's I mean, all like yeah. i win i win i win mm. it's yeah it's it's it's, 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 it's weird because it, it seems like he's really wanting to lay into the batman but then he's he's also got sort of so many ideas beyond that like he's going beyond Batman. It's like, oh, oh, I'm going i was to about to say it. <laughs> You beat me to it. It's like he's gonna he's gonna take out Batman, but then it's not so much like the um, the eternal like oh it's you and me together, Batman. I can't wait to just engage in the game again. It seems more like no, I'm doing this, and then you're gonna die, and then I'm just gonna be left to go, like now I'm Joker in the future. I gotta go around going crazy. It's gonna be great and stuff. You know, it reminds me. And if it was if it was anything less, then Batman would have been able to figure it out much sooner. Yeah. Yeah, but it, yeah. I don't know if you've, you, you've probably seen the movie Mega Mind, the animated movie. Yeah, Megamind. way back when it yeah, came out. Yeah, and that's all about you know a villain. Uh, he he keeps trying to beat the hero and never gets to beat him. So it's all about their rivalry. And I think the Joker is the same thing. Like he lives to fight Batman. Mm, mm. You know that's well. Th- I think that's yeah. That, and again, that's the you know the, the beauty at the, at the end of the Dark Knight. Him saying like, "You and I are destined to do this forever." Yeah. And then it turns out, oh, next movie, no, Batman retires. <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> He's <a bit> broken. <laughs> uh, but uh, but I, th- I think this iteration of the Joker, because there's stuff he says throughout this chunk as well. It's like they they mark him as been very different from particularly what the, the modern interpretation of the Joker is. And again, not just the Fight Club thing and the Fight Club evolving into a Heath Ledger Joker, which evolves into this, you know, him now being this, you know, um, like 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 in this very film in Batman Beyond in general, where he has like gangs of followers, like the Jokers, who are essentially the space monkeys. Like yeah, the people who fall and fall in this guy's word. Just the the concept of the teachings of the Joker. Um, like there's there's that evolution of things. Then there's also the concept that this chunk instills, where the Joker exists as a kind of supernatural presence almost like mm. that he's almost like a virus of some sort which is a thing that's become like yeah that's that's locked in to different kinds of batman media since the big one for this in particular uh is have either of you t- uh either of you two played arkham knight no i've i've <laughs> I've purchased it with the intention of playing it, but I, I never played it more than like uh, about 10 to 15 minutes in. 
Oh, Don't wow. Don't worry, I bought the Batman Telltale games on release so I could play them and, like, stream it to listeners of the podcast, and I still have them bloody installed. Wow, so... I don't know, like, it's been 10 years, Bubba. <laughs> Do you want, to, <laughs> want me to get into what happens in Batman and Arkham Knight? Or... Um, I'll, 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 I'll have to be... I made notes on it. I have to proceed. Uh, <laughs> but no, uh, b- b- uh, when Arkham City, the previous game that that came out, one of the big publici- publicized things was like, this is Mark Hamill's last appearance as the Joker. Oh, yeah. And at the end of the game, he dies. Uh, and there's a big moment, and Batman's inexplicably really bummed out, even though Talia al Ghul's dead as well. But yet, yet he cares more about the Joker being dead than Talia. Um, and then, so it was a big thing when Arkham Knight was coming out. It was like, no, it's next, it's Scarecrow's the villain. It's, you know, it's just a whole new thing, and the, hmm. no publicity to anything beyond, like, you can play the Batmobile, look at all how cool it looks. It's going to be, like, we got the Riddler's back, it's got freaking Two Faces in here, we'll, the Man Bat, you get to fight, all this sort of stuff. And then people are like, yeah, you're going to miss Mark Hamill. He's not going to be in the game. Halfway through, (laughs) he reappears. But he's like in Batman's mind. And it turns out that the Joker from like injecting people with his blood in the previous game has like become like a weird mind virus. So throughout the rest of the game, the Joker is with Batman the whole time, constantly talking in his ear. You get more Mark Hamill than you would ever want in your entire life, basically. <laughs> you get more than you got in the previous game. Yeah, you get more than you got in the previous game and the game before that combined <laughs> in the second half of Arkham Knight. He never shuts up in it. Uh, and it's kind of the point where, like, oh, man, I kind of wish he had stayed dead. Um, and that's, oh, that's funny, it. too, I because that, that's another connection to Fight Club, because in, you know, spoilers for, the, uh, for Fight Club 2, the graphic novel, but... Tyler Durden is revealed to be kind of a virus that uh, was passed oh. down from generation. That's uh, his. Uh, that's the narrator's grandfather and father both had it, and then he shows up in in Jack's kid. Is uh, uh, Tyler Durden is being passed on to his kid? Yeah, they they they. Got I'm the- going to be honest. I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because it seems Tyler's very much a, a reaction to a certain set of circumstances and stuff, uh-huh. where it's like, um, I think it's the kind of thing like if you found out like in Falling Down that Michael Douglas's dad, Kirk Douglas, had also freaked out in a warm car one day in, in L.A. and went on a rampage. You know? um, let's, let's do it. Falling Down Origins. <laughs> <laughs> we also did a very good, we, uh, me and John, and was it Neil was on for that? We did a review of Falling Down a couple of years ago. We that did. Was... It's been that long. I actually can't remember. Did we have anyone with us? We might not, because Neil was on for Joker, I think. And then yeah. I think maybe... I have an idea he might have been there for that as well, but then they're kind of similarish kind of films, so maybe well, maybe we'll listen to it, it people. <laughs> it was very good. It was a very good review. If I do say so myself. Yeah. Um, but no, so the in the game though, it turns out then like, yeah, there's a series of people that you have to go around who have been infected with this Joker mind virus and who are basically turning into the Joker. And that's a major thing. So you go like this is a little sweet old man you rescue at one point, and it turns out, no, he's actually like a hidden Joker. He's got the Joker inside him. Uh, there's like a random singer guy you have to take out in like a kind of old derelict casino mm. and he's crooning away when you're trying to like trying to take out bombs and stuff like that uh but he's doing it he starts singing and then mark hamill takes over and it's all like yeah like these people oh, have yeah, become, essentially become the joker much like tim drake here so there, there's that element as well and then that kind of evolves into like one of the big things in 2020 they had was um the black label dc thing had the three Jokers, where it was revealed, and then this gets into really nebulous, crazy DC continuity crap. In one <laughs> issue, it was revealed that Batman sat in like the Mobius chair, which was a Green Lantern thing that is the it knows all and it sees all. Yeah, that it already lost me. <laughs> <laughs> and once he's in there, he's like, you know, ask it anything, and it will. It, it has all the answers in the universe. And one of the questions Batman asks is, like, what's the Joker's real name? And then the Mobius chair tells him there were three Jokers. And Batman's like, no, that's not that's not true. That's impossible. It's impossible. <laughs> um, and, yeah, they did a big event where it turns out, like, yeah, they, they were three, literally three men who were all the Joker. But they were all, like, explanations as to why he had changed as the character over the years. So uh... you had one called, like... The the criminal who was the golden age Joker who was a bit more grim and a bit more 
like a you know kind of like a Dick Tracy villain almost like he's a bit more like Heath Ledger's Joker as well. Um, you had the clown who was like the goofy, silly, Silver Age Joker who was all the kind of Cesar Romero, you know, that kind of stuff. And then the comedian who's kind of like from the Killing Joke onwards, who's the really sadistic, the really vindictive Joker. Uh, and they had a whole big event where like a lot of people really hated the three Jokers. I thought I thought it was okay. Um, it does a thing at the end where the Joker abducts Joe Chill, knowing because he knows that Bruce is Batman. And he's going to turn Joe Chill into a Joker. Because he's just like, oh, just yeah. Just phrase, I'm going to turn you into a Joker. Yeah, it's, it's already just, like, oh, Jesus. Like, oh, yeah, you, you, you can turn anyone into a Joker. If you, like, if you just get the right chemicals mm. and then you just inject them with a thing, they all become the Joker. Uh, and there's a whole thing then at the end where the reason he did that was because he was trying to get Bruce Wayne to essentially forgive Joe Chill to move past like the beef he has with him. Like all the anger that Joker, uh, the Batman has about Joe Chill and the death of his parents, so the Joker could be like the main focal point of of his of his mind, basically. <laughs> of then, like, you get rid of all these other criminals. I want you to only be thinking about me, and it's kind of like that weird, tenuous, like, yeah, you're not thinking about some other asshole who killed your parents anymore because now I'm the only person in your life who matters, Bruce. Like, it's it's just you and me, baby. Um, which I liked as a little thing, and then they threw in really stupid stuff about like as always. always they always knew who the joker was and all the stuff in the killing joke about his wife dying was all fake and all like, it was just really stupid stuff uh, so i didn't like that part but the joe chill thing where batman does forgive joe chill where like joe chill goes on a whole thing about like i killed the waynes because i knew who they were and i was jealous of they had so much and i had nothing but then over time i found out that they were actually really good people and then i've, I've always i've always harbored regret for what i did and stuff and bruce kind of has like a okay yeah like all right man like oh we're, we're cool you know kind of thing <laughs> out of it it's like oh i like i like that it's a thing uh yeah, bruce okay. maturing instead of being like you know i like a i like a batman who can evolve like the the r pattinson batman where at the no, end he's like batman must always always be a like repressed moody <laughs> teenager <laughs> inside uh, but yeah, and even so, but that kind of idea, like, oh, the Joker could be multiple people. Scott Snyder did a thing where it was like an indication that the Joker was like hundreds of years old and he had been around, like, back in the day and stuff. Like, <laughs> uh, and it's all it's, uh, even prior to that too. I looked into this; I had never heard of this thing before. Um, but there's a comic by people called uh, Pepe Moreno and Doug Murray mm. called Batman Digital Justice. <laughs> Uh, and within Batman Digital Justice, it was a, com- a one shot comic came out in the early 1990s. And I would advise you, like, advise people to look us up now. Just look up images from it. Uh, it was completely digitally made for 1991, so it's all digital art from back then, which is like, okay. That's that's rare. Yeah, the thing now, if you said that, you'd be like, they did what an AI did the art. Oh, fuck off! Like you know, you would just be <laughs> outraged by it. But the fact that it's back then, it's like, yeah, it's experimental technology. We've created this Batman comic. Oh, so they're to blame. Well, kind of. I'm assuming maybe they had to do, like, they had to literally physically go in and, you know, do stuff. They didn't just go, computer, go, like that kind of thing. Uh, But, yeah, you get this thing. It's set in the distant future at the end of the 21st century where James Gordon Jr., who's, like, Jim Gordon's grandson, ends up taking over the mantle of Batman, who's, like, long dead and he's got statues up of him and stuff. And it's a big, it's a big Neo-Gotham, like in Batman Beyond. Um and it's very, it's a bit Blade Runner-y looking. It's very Total Recall looking. Like oh, the big influence okay. of it seems to be Total Recall, uh, which I guess had just come out at that point. Um, and there's like all these other, the street gangs like the Jokers, but they're called like the Neo Surfers and the Beachheads and things like this, like stupid street gangs like that. That sounds like Mystery uh, Men. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, stupid stupid right, street gang games. <laughs> um, and then uh, I, I really advise people to look this up. It becomes apparent over the after a while that because everyone in the future, it's a really crazy sci-fi concept where everyone's hooked on this thing called the net, uh, and people spend all their time on computers and just like are really <laughs> this thing that sort of links them together and gives them all their information and stuff, and people spend all their day on that. Oh, I've never heard of anything like That's that. That's just too. Really... It's just too far-fetched. I can't buy it. Yeah, no, no, no <laughs> I'm not a, into it. It turns out though that the net has been controlled by. The Joker, but, not the, but the Joker is dead. It's like the Joker injected his mind into the internet, basically, 
and became like, and you want to see, because most of the art's pretty okay. You look up <laughs> Digital Justice to see the version of the Joker they did. It's the most early 90s looking reboot-esque stupid looking cgi art ever where he's just made all entirely out of like triangles and stuff oh it's... god i've seen that. that i didn't know that's what it was yeah yeah that's, that's it he does this. it looks it looks pretty hilarious to be fair <laughs> but um but so i was just like is that where it came from the freaking the idea of the joker as a mind because then you're like it says the reason that the people making batman beyond would would have watched you know <laughs> would have been reading batman comics and someone's like oh batman of the future i read one of those back then and like the joker was like a mind virus and or something there and it's like yeah you've all been into this here so a lot of weird history where the joker's gone from like like in the three jokers like yeah he used to be like a grim calculating criminal type who became goofy clown guy became really vindictive horrific the worst of the worst then it we and the in the turn of the millennium, it's got it's just gone bonkers. Where he's like, <laughs> is he immortal? Do you have to even be in a physical body to be the Joker? Can the Joker hop from body to body? Is it is it like Jason goes to hell, where he's like a little worm that flies out of people's mouths and into other people's <laughs> mouths to take over them? Like you just go like, how what what can't you do with the Joker now? It's like it's, you, it was simple enough when he's just a clown asshole who fell into some chemicals. All right, like it was fair enough. But no, you've got to complicate it, Niall. You've got to complicate it to keep making more comics and more yeah. comics and more cartoons. And I, I do wonder if, the, if the flames were really stoked by people been like, oh, Tim Drake was the Joker. Okay, so you could so anybody could be the Joker then. You can just do that willy nilly. Like that's like that's uh yeah yeah they, so, yeah yeah. <laughs> that's my little so my little side rant tirade I went on there. <laughs> so I had to distract from the actual chunk we're talking about here. But, what us go off topic? Never. No, no. but um. I was gonna say that because like, we do get a, quite a bit of uh, monologuing Dean Stockwell here. Uh, how, how familiar are you guys with uh, Dean Stockwell? Because he's he's is a prolific actor. Oh boy, that's a quantum leap quote. <laughs> oh god, I didn't even make the connection. <laughs> that's where oh, I first boy. knew him from. Anyway, oh boy, I mean he doesn't say it, you know. Uh, Scott Bakula does, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I have to say too, like, and his legacy being like every time Dean Stockwell's come up, people have been instantly like Quantum Leap. Yep. <laughs> it's like, yep, yeah, <laughs> this guy won like you know was it the like you know, can film best actor and stuff multiple times back in the fifties and <laughs> stuff like all. Oh, but people are like, yep, Ziggy, him with the cigar, it's iconic. Him showing up with the crazy, the crazy mm-hmm. shirts. And yeah, stuff. I, I like, only ever know him as old Dean Stockwell. Like he, I don't know anything that he was in when he was younger. I know he was in some yeah, Star was Treks a, and other things, but like, no. Yeah, and he he was a he's a child actor too. You can see him. You can see baby Dean Stockwell like way back when. Um, I, we I think it, though, um, Quantum Leap becoming so big when it did mm. really hits people sort of our age and up now. Yeah, because uh, yeah, we're, we're about yeah, the same age, obviously. Because um, yeah, we've literally been just on repeat. Repeats of Quantum Leap would have been on the TV. Yeah, all the time, I'm older, so, so yeah. like I was alive and uh, you know. Old enough to remember it when it was on the first time. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I watched the entire run whenever it first aired. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah, my dad was. A I watched fan. it when it was. I watched it when it was on here, but I don't. That might have been a little while after. This was back in the day where we might get a program here that you had three years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like I remember it used to be crazy when like I'd be watching episodes of Animaniacs and it'd be like 1994. And I'd see at the end credits to be like, you know, copyright 1992. And I was like, oh, yeah. man, this episode's only like two years old. Like, yeah. we're, get, we're getting this pretty fresh over in our life now. <laughs> that was quick then. That was quick. Yeah. Remember, remember when they started releasing m- movies here six months after America? That was exciting. <laughs> and now it's like, yeah, Game of Thrones is on literally at 2 a.m. here so people can watch it the same time it drops in America because <laughs> no one's waiting for anything anymore. And people wanted to wait like so little for uh, the Godzilla movie that it's like the most pirated thing Yeah, yeah, ever. yeah. I was stunned that they, they took so long. Yeah, Godzilla minus one. I was like, what do you mean it's not out in digital yet? It's been months. <laughs> like, like no, we're... It's, a, it's a thing with Japan. Mm. They... Japan almost like they don't seem to understand the technology they've created. Right? <laughs> they don't get like, well, why, why would, why would these other countries want to see Godzilla? Mm. <laughs> you know, they, they don't seem to get it. And it's like, no, release it. I'll give you money right now. <laughs> uh, but um, but yeah, I yeah, think we mentioned in uh, 
uh, previous episode, like, when Dean Stockwell was a kid, he was in. He was the star of a movie called The Boy with Green Hair. I saw that in like, IMDb trivia. <laughs> yeah, and it's like. That's probably why they cast him. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like a little joke. <laughs> well, that, it's a it's a movie about my life as a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that and Dean uh, Stockwell has a pretty iconic voice as well. Like when you, as soon as you hear him, you know who it is. Yes, yeah, he does have a very distinct like. Um, I would have liked just actually like his take on the Joker, just to see what he would have done with oh, it. Yeah. He never gets to go into the Hamill like Hamill takes over when the mania kicks in, but like. Yeah, with Gene Stockwell as a version of of the Joker would have been an intriguing because he's a oh, guy that's up for great. doing weird stuff. Like he's a, you know, he was a David Lynch staple for for a while. Well, it, been, so. it would have been very easy to do, like it, because the Joker states that he's just now becoming powerful enough to do this physical transformation. Tim Drake could have been acting like the Joker as Tim Drake yeah. for a little bit before he made the physical transformation. Hmm. Agree. That'd be amazing. Mm-hmm. Oh crap! Yeah, we find like then these. Dean Stockwell starts doing a weird transatlantic accent and all do it. Like, oh, you, why, why you sound like Catherine Hepburn all of a sudden? What's going on here? Then again, you say, and I agree, that he's got a very distinctive voice. He does, absolutely. But I think cause, because I never, ever, ever would have put him in this or in this role, I didn't mm. pick up on it at first. I was like, well, who's mm. this? That can't be Dean Stockwell. <laughs> he must be turning up later in the movie. I don't think there's ever been an animated movie ever where I didn't have IMDb open because I'm always like, I know that voice. I know that voice. <laughs> You've got to get yeah. it right away. That was like the idea that John is watching most animated films going, that can't be Dean Stockwell. Who <laughs> shows up like, well, like that's definitely not him and then sometimes yeah, it turns out to be him they're like whoa every cartoon I watch now I just assume it's Dean Stockwell I've been, it's ruined me <laughs> although I always oh, found out though John do you know what Dean Stockwell is in 11 episodes of that we now have to we have to talk, cover this now Jag exactly <laughs> Dean Stockwell is in 11 episodes of Jag <laughs> so now, if you're a new listener you might be like how did John guess that <laughs> Because we always talk about Jack. Okay? Yeah, yeah. We've talked about, I think, like, Coolio was in an, epi- in an episode of Jack, and then we keep all roads lead back to Jack. And then the fact when, like, if you go on his Wikipedia page, he's like, he's known for this, 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 and his role as Colonel Hapablap in 11 episodes of Jack. Is like, Incredible. Is, is he known for that? Is that what he's known for? I don't think it is. But, I feel uh, bad that I literally know him for two things. Mm. I know him for Quantum Leap and for the uh, Battlestar reboot. Oh, do, do, uh, the original Lynch Dune as well. He's um. Yeah, well, yeah, but that that came later. I, mm. I didn't see that for years. Remember the the first time I watched that. I, I what was it like ten years ago? Yeah, yeah. I think I think that to, to me it's it's mostly Blue Velvet. Like the in dreams I walk. He you know, does the weird mimes to Roy Orbison and yeah. stuff. Like he's very 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 strange character. Uh, shocking enough for a David Lynch movie. But um, what? <laughs> I always associate him now with um. A movie that like I keep waiting for it to have a kind of weird renaissance because like it's a kind of hidden gem. Uh, but he and Neil Young, you know, noted rock star Neil Young, co-directed a film called Human Highway. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, and it features like a lot of David Lynch people too, like Charlotte Stewart and stuff's in it as well, and Dennis Hopper is there, uh, and Devo. It's Neil Young and Devo combined forces. To make a movie about like a diner at the end, like next to a nuclear power station at the end of the world. I would never put those two musical acts together. <laughs> no, <laughs> and you get to see them. Prefer- and it's like it depends how much you know about Devo. Because I watched it and I was like, "What the hell's going on?" Because like uh, we call Boogie Boy, like the weird, the, the lead singer of Devo will occasionally put on like a rubber mask and it's become terrifying. He looks like a serial killer. Yeah, and he'll put on a high pitched voice and become this character called Boogie Boy. And Boogie Boy is a character in Human Human Highway, and Devo all play like the 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 tech people at the nuclear power plant, and it's like yeah, it's one of these ones. It's, like, it's a weird musical where like Neil Young's like this young kid on a bike, even though he's clearly like forty five years old. Of it. <laughs> and uh, Dean Stockwell's the guy who runs like the um, runs the diner, and Russ Tamblin, Doctor Jacoby from Twin Peaks, is also there. Incredible. And apparently, yeah, the whole thing was like it was Neil Young, Dean Stockwell, and Russ Tamblin made this movie together like it was their whole thing and then neil young's like i'm getting i'm getting in the devo kids uh and so there's like <laughs> lengthy 
massive musical sequences of like Devo and Neil Young playing Neil Young songs at each other and stuff. So we're covering this next season. It's it's incredible. Like it's a it, it had a reputation because I think it came out in 1982. It didn't get released on video until 1995. Yeah, um, and it had a reputation uh, as being one of the worst films ever made, and I then people <laughs> actually watched it, and it was like, "This is this isn't bad at all." Like it's it's very very strange. Like it's a very it's a proper surreal movie. Like, um, but uh, and then it's one of those things that they say like, "Oh, Dennis Hopper accidentally cut someone's hand open on set, and he had to admit like, yeah, I was on drugs at the time." If you see, if you look at Dennis Hopper at any point in the film, you've never seen a man more obviously on drugs. On film. Like he, he just looks like he's out of his head the entire time. But Dennis Hopper, oh, I just God. assume he's always on drugs unless I'm told otherwise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I think I think by Blue Velvet he got clean, like he was okay then. So you think anything like after the '80s, he's like, oh yeah, he's, he's thinking like speed and stuff. He's fine. Yeah. But yeah, for, like the uh, what about him and the Wicked in uh, the Crow movie, <laughs> Wicked Prayer? <laughs> Yeah. Oh God! <laughs> I always forget there are other crow movies. Yeah, yeah. David Boreanaz was the crow at one point. Yeah. <laughs> I love the way they just oh, went. He, he was get one that, of the villains. Get that angel it, guy. It, no. it was um, the the kid from Terminator Two, Edward oh, Furlong. Man. He was the crow. Oh, well, they get the cr- the crow like a weird mind virus just spreads from people, <laughs> <laughs> and then the, 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 everyone keeps comparing the Heath Ledger's Joker to the crow. It's like, oh my god, these things, everything is connected. Oh Everything's my god, everything's connected. Now I'm wondering exactly. if, like, is you know, James Bond always changes actors? Is James Bond a mind virus? <gasps> Maybe James Bond is a symbiote, <laughs> and it has to get a new host, like in DS Nine. Yeah. Oh, that's it. That's we've discovered it. That's why he's always called James Bond. Oh, wow. I just like the idea that like some nerdy scientist has been like, you know, going into a crazy laugh and then like, ah, 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 and then there's all of a sudden taking off the jacket, the tuxedo underneath. He's like, hello, yeah. money, penny. And then, and then <laughs> the music then just the doom, orchestra head like da 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 da. It's like, oh, Bond, it's good you're here. <laughs> it was created by Q. As a special weapon for Her oh, Majesty. Amazing, yeah. <laughs> I would one hundred percent are colliding. <laughs> I would one hundred percent go for that. Like, yeah, next James Bond, he could be anybody because <laughs> he's a mind virus this time. And I think, have you ever seen Return of the Joker? No. Have you ever seen uh, Jason Goes to Hell, <laughs> the Final Friday? <laughs> of course, yes, everyone's favorite one. <laughs> um, but no, and of course, uh, the big thing that Dean Stock was in. Um, really have to give him credit for is Paris, Texas. Wim Wenders' Paris, Texas was an absolute masterpiece of uh, of the 80s. He's not the main character. Harry Dean Stanton's the main character, but he plays his brother. And uh, yeah, if you've, if, you've never, if you've never treated yourself to Paris, Texas, I highly recommend seeing it. I actually out. haven't, believe it or not. With those two in, you probably would think I, I had. It's a, no, it's an incredible, incredible film. Uh, it's, yeah, so periodically just gets mentioned and people just remember how good it is. <laughs> and be like, wow, yeah, remember that? Um but yeah, it's a, that's kind of like the real, you know, if Dean Stockwell is remembered for anything, it'll be Quantum Leap, uh, Paris, Texas, and his 11 episodes of JAG. Uh, <laughs> I believe. <laughs> we keep threatening the listeners with our podcast, RuPaul's Dra- uh, JAG oh, Race. Oh, boy. Oh, yeah, but Batman is JAG Race. We had to do it. I think this, at this point now, like, we at least have to do the Dean Stockwell episodes. <laughs> like, just yeah. to come. It's um, that could be the pilot. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I mean, to speak, you know, it's a naval thing. There's lots of pilots uh, as well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, in a voice, yeah, in a voice could... talent related tangent, um, when I was looking for this movie to watch it, I wanted to watch it as a whole before I watched the chunks that I was assigned. And I, mm. it wasn't streaming anywhere here in Canada. So I went through a back door to find it another way, we'll say. <laughs> but I didn't realize that they did the thing where they pitched the sound up so that, you know, whatever you know, software that the companies use to scan for, for you know, pirated uh, stuff won't catch it. So I didn't realize that everyone was like, you know, speaking in a higher tone than oh my god so i was I, you're used to you know uh, batman you know like a very deep voice for batman so then terry is first batman we see on screen and he sounds like a little kid and i'm very <laughs> confused and I'm batman. I'm, I'm batman and then when uh the joker appears and i can finally figure out that that is that is mark hamill he sounds very high as well and so does dean stockwell and i was so confused and i'm like okay well that's a choice i guess 
<laughs> and then I finally watched my five minute chunk and I'm just like, oh. <laughs> Wait a minute. It was such to be fair, though, we, we do pitch down the clips we send people, though, just to, just to mess with people's heads. <laughs> the ultimate fun. We should, start, we should start doing that now as a test. I think you should see if people pick up on it. You should it. do what we, we discussed in the green room beforehand. Just put like the, the cave echo sounds on everything. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Niall, please, when you edit this, put in sound effects like we're in a hello, cave. Hello, mm, please. hello, please. <laughs> I was like, yeah, it should those be are, easy enough. Yeah, because we were, we were saying uh, off mic, those, but like, it'd be such a pain in the ass to actually record in a bat cave because the amount of like the squealing bats and stuff, you'd be like, in between every bit of speaking, like, oh, I have to silence that, silence that. How long is this recording? Oh, an hour and fifty. Oh, Jesus Christ! Oh, no, the bats that's are coming back to roost. Never went duck. No. <laughs> Um, I, I've only been into a bat cave once, and I was absolutely terrified. Hmm. I know they're not going to hurt me, but it, you can't see them, and they're flying around, and you can feel them. And hear them. It was horrible. Yeah, and then there's mm. the guano everywhere, which is another thing. Well, I kept I kept stressing out about that. I was like, oh, my God, I think one of them just, you know, crapped in my hair. I had hair at the time. Um, <laughs> I was like, oh, God, oh, God. And then, of course, when I got out, they hadn't at all. <laughs> Well, let me say though, if you had crap in your hair and then the guy caused your hair to fall out and you're like, that's why I hate bats so much. Uh, it's my villain origin story. Yeah. Yeah. At the bottom of a well. That was the, that was yeah. the, the, the revamp of Egghead. <laughs> <laughs> you're allowed to call me that because you're a fellow Egghead. Yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> like, no, no one else can use that term, though. Just, no, <laughs> just no, us. only us. Only us in the community, the bald community. Yeah. But um, but yeah, so then we, we you know, we, we get this transformation. And um, as much as I... I, I I'm totally okay with this being the, the the twist is like yeah it turned out it was, it was literally him the whole time and somehow the Joker has done this thing where he can physically turn um, Let's Tim Drake get physical. into there is a a moment of like but seriously what the hell <laughs> like <laughs> and this is up there, like I guess Susan if you've not seen Mask of the Phantasm we had a lot of fun with that last season because at the oh. Actually, I would advise just going watch, watching Mask of the Phantasm when it's revealed who the what the fa- who the Phantasm is. It's such a drastic change in the person's physicality that we're just like, what in the name of God? I <laughs> they defended just... it, if I remember. I think you could really though, because after a while, it's just like, <laughs> yeah, it makes no logistical sense. Yeah. But the fact that even like in, when the Joker transforms, he's like, oh, that flabby oaf. And he's like, where did the weight go? Like, what, <laughs> have you got a girdle under there? Like, what the hell is like, how is this like the Joker health plan? It's like in five seconds, I, you can shed over 40 pounds. <laughs> like, well, that that's why but everybody I knows that your, your muscle tone is defined in your DNA. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, that's why I think you could have the, the whole Joker time he's taking in. over his brain, like literally, like he is here with a chip. Great. Just don't change his body. Mm. Have him as as um, as you said before, season like put makeup on. Yeah, like smear yeah. like white and green and purple or whatever else across his face or whatever. Yeah. But and do it all like wrong. It's all like messed exactly. up and like smeared and yeah. And he looks even more there unhinged, be a scene. right? <laughs> there could be a scene where he's applying it to his face like, and he's like shaking and laughing and he's like rubbing the white all over with his bare hands. Yeah, and, it'd be even more terrifying, I think. Mm. Yeah, but I mean, I hate, um, I always bump against these things in other movies as well, like like the Mission Impossible movies or Charlie's Angels or wherever. Like someone's wearing a disguise and a <laughs> super duper mask, so they're played by someone else, and then they take the mask off, and suddenly they're three inches taller and half the size, <laughs> and you're just like, what? Well, no, because if it, if it's Tom Cruise wearing the mask, he takes it off and he's three inches shorter. Well, yeah, it vary. Mm. The results may vary. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, my favorite part of the transformation, though, is like I've had to repeat it so many times because it's just very it's, a, it's the cheeky way they do it. Where like there's the big close up of the, the start on his hand and you see his hand getting paler and paler and it goes over to his face and he's laughing and he has what he has the Tim Drake nose and then he kind of ducks his head down and it comes back up and his nose is completely changed <laughs> as well. And his chin. Like, <laughs> fact, yeah, and his chin. It's just the fact that like. Mask of Phantasm was one thing, but this is ridiculous. Yeah. Like he's literally transmogrified his entire being. Like it's so like at well, the fundamental that's what DNA, DNA does. level. <laughs> Clearly. Yeah, he's he's 
It's a uh, yeah. He's properly like it, it, it. You know, it's Cronenbergian in a weird way. Like he's be- yeah, slowly become. It's not slowly mm-hmm. because he's instantaneously become the Joker. Oh, uh, if it was halfway to being the Fly, that'd be fantastic. Oh, that'd be great. That'd be amazing. Like yeah, uh, we'll do a, a sequel to this where the Joker's seeping back in and Tim Drake's slowly turning into him or something. Yeah. Like. And, um, and then he points directly to, and this is the MacGuffin right here on this exact spot in my neck. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I'm really lucky that Tim never got that mold checked uh, his entire <laughs> life. You know? I love how they, they show you the internal workings of the chip, just in case you don't understand what a chip is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, just in case, you know, that maybe they're like, well, you know. It's a computer, <laughs> kids. <laughs> Hmm. People are still kind of getting into computers yeah. at this time. <laughs> I, was, I really like though if he got if he had ever gone to the doctor about that. It's like yeah, I got a weird. I don't think I had that one. Even when like, um, even when he was back at Wayne Manor when he was a kid, just been like Alfred, been like I don't believe Master Drake had that a mole, and he's like you want to get that checked, sir. Uh, and then going to the doctor, been like it doesn't appear to be cancerous. It appears to be a small microchip. <laughs> it appears, it appears to be contains the entire. <laughs> Yeah, it's, a computer. It's, it's a computerous uh, mole that <laughs> may contain the entire uh, entity that is the Joker. <laughs> so we've been told that he has a wife and kids, right? Tim Drake has yeah, no yeah. life. So his wife has never thought, you know, well, you know, in an intimate moment thinking, what is this? It, it hums. Yeah, yeah, flick, it like hums, flicks the mole it hums quietly <laughs> and it, it makes a, it has a strange kind of sound and it's mm. warm. It's gonna be. It'll be. It'll be. It becomes like a face-off thing, where like you know, when um, when Nick Cage becomes John Travolta, and he goes into, his, he has to infiltrate his house and like deal, you know, deal with his, you know, he ends up like helping out his daughter and stuff, and like yeah, he, he revives the love life between Sean Archer and his wife and stuff. Um, you have to wonder then when Tim Drake gets home, it's just gonna be like his wife and like so, oh, like. You know, those evenings we had was that you or was that the Joker? Like, what, what was going oh, yeah, on that, there? That marriage is over. Like she, she is just like I can't ever be sure who you are or what you yeah, are. Yeah. I'm taking the kids and I'm going. Fa- yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he, the, the Joker does demonstrate like oh he can put on the voice like he can go over and be like oh whatever honey like mm-hmm. you know it's um although I like the two like the Joker be like no I wouldn't have done it because he to be fair I'm changing everything when I when I transform. Tim Drake doesn't have it down there. Like, I have it down there. (laughs) The Joker has it where it counts. You see my big pointy nose and my big pointy chin? (laughs) Extrapolate. BDE, you know. (laughs) You know what they say about big noses, Batman. Big chins. (laughs) I know what you keep saying about big noses, asshole. (laughs) Plus, he's a clown. Big feet. Yeah. (laughs) And apparently he's also encoded in learning uh, algorithms because it's a microchip that takes, what, 20 20 years, 25 years (laughs) for him to fully uh, exercise his power. That's the only question I have. Like, why did he enact a plan that would take decades then again, that's quite Joker, I suppose. Yeah, I think that's just quite like villain as well. Like that was always the big question at the end of uh, Ghostbusters Two, where like Vigo wants a body and he's going to go into this baby, and you're like, why not just go into an adult? Because <laughs> the baby's not going to do anything for a while, man. You're going to have to grow up, you know. It's uh yeah. And then you find out he could have taken over Ray at any given minute. <laughs> and you're like, and Ray was most willing. Just... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so it's like. Why didn't you just do that then? Why would you go into the baby? So yeah, why why is the Joker like? I guess I maybe he. But then Tim Drake was such a, an able kid. You think he'd be like? Yeah, well, I, I don't know. Like maybe it, it took it just yeah it just took him time basically to build up to been able to take over the body or something well, like it. Just... Two questions. <laughs> One is the Joker just an AI, and two it, it he says at some point it took me years to work up the strength. I'm like, is he in this tiny little chip lifting weights? <laughs> How is he building this strength? Yeah, what does he mean by that maybe, phrase exactly? It's because if he's physically rewriting Tim's DNA to physically manifest, maybe it just took years of like, oh, I have to like, I had to like rewire his brainwaves and stuff to warp yeah. it into Joker brainwaves. So he's so doing, he's in this like, little chip and he's doing like a nine to five job of like computer programming on Tim's brain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a, it's a tough, tough it's a grind. Life. It's a grind. <laughs> He had to go through puberty twice as well, I guess. <laughs> like, oh, man. That was, 
I was thinking, I have to tell you, I was there when uh, Becky turned him down for the prom. And it, was, it, was, it was ugly. <laughs> me... That would actually be really cute if at the last minute he realised, ah, oh, you know what, I've got I've got a real connection to this guy. Yeah. <laughs> it could be anything after what he's like, I've grown quite attached to Tim. Back when Julie broke up with him and I was the only thing, the only person he had to turn to. Oh, bless. And when his puppy was killed, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Although you're, you're the other thing you mentioned there, um, I, mean, I actually don't just thinking think... though, like Bruce giving like, how could you do this? Like, Bruce, where were you when he went through his first divorce? I was here. <laughs> where were you? You were not there for him. I was. <laughs> so the the other thing you said though, I I don't think that's actually. I I wouldn't call it the Joker. No, it's closer no. to an AI, yeah. like you, like you suggested. Yeah. I, maybe that's not the right term, but it's not really him. It's well, it's the thing again. You know, we always say that uh, Chris Nolan uh, takes things for Batman, but the in referencing another Chris Nolan movie, uh, The Prestige. Oh, where great movie, great movie, amazing movie. If uh, people haven't seen The Prestige, uh, I'm sorry, this is going to be the fifteenth film we spoke <laughs> for you <laughs> this this very episode. But yeah, it turns out that like Hugh Jackman, as part of his magic act, invents a machine that can double him, double him. So instead of him actually transporting across a room, he's actually it's actually like a, a clone appears at the other side, and then he instantly kills the clone. So, at the, but at one point, he says like, "Yeah, I never." The, the thing could transport you though, so I never knew if I was gonna if I was gonna be the guy over on the other side who would get killed, and so you never know. The, the actual mm-hmm. Hugh Jackman at the start of the movie could be dead. It's just that the, the, it's a clone that's taken over, and then but he's quite comfortable in that because it's all part of a plan of vengeance against Christian Bale. <laughs> um, and I was just, I, that always really freaked me out because like oh because. You're like, oh, you're getting your vengeance, but you're dead, though, man. You're gone. Yeah. Like, there's a version of you running around that's out there. But it's not you. Yeah. I mean, the if, there's a, like, oh, yeah, I'm, if there's a room full I'm, of Hugh Jackmans out there somewhere, I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, like, we'll, we'll get the info for you. <laughs> yeah, like, all the good, uh, you see at the end of the movie, he's got a whole basement full of them, all, in, uh, <laughs> all preserved in tanks. So. Living the dream. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, yeah, so in Joker's plan, though, which I kind of, like, you know, again, his ego have been like, I'm going to figure out a way to live forever, basically. But it would also be like, but it's not, you're still going to be dead, though. Like, I, it's, I it's, think, though, that doesn't bother him almost. I think he just wants to annoy Bruce Wayne. I think I think he just even wants to go beyond beyond that though, because his plan is in here to just like, oh, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna kill Batman, I'm gonna blow up Wayne Manor, and then it's just gonna be like it's Joker's homecoming party, and I, like, but it's like I get to live forever now, but then it's not you who's living forever, no. Joker. <laughs> like you're you the physical entity, and whatever you know, electrical neurons you know firing in your brain, uh, that's gone. Like, unless you physically moved your actual spirit into that mole. Well, then you bring up the question about, is there a soul, now? This is getting very deep. Yeah, but even if there's not, it's like, but that, you're not literally moving the actual no. entity in, in your physical matter over but into then the thing either. are we not our brain, and the brain is electricity? It's a computer? Unless, but unless, like somehow, in the when he got shot by that thing, he went over and plugged himself into Tim Drake's neck, mm-hmm. and then the electricity from his brain went into the microchip. It's like no, it's still there's a there's a version of you running around, and you guess you can die knowing that like, yeah. hey, in forty years time, that's gonna be a pain in someone's ass. But <laughs> I'm not gonna be there because I'm gonna be dead. You know, it's. But he probably still finds it funny. Yeah, yeah. That's the thing. He, he's like, oh, won't it be hilarious that I'll actually be gone? But this thing. <laughs> well, this reminds me of a theory uh, as a Star Trek podcast that I at least used to listen to. Um, oh, yes. Uh, called Star Trek: The Next uh, Conversation, and their theory was that, and I think it's become a popular theory since then, that uh, transporters in Star mm-hmm. Trek murder you, then recreate you. So the question Ooh, is, I've heard are this. you the same mm. person? After you've transported, as you were before you transported. Yeah, you become. Apparently, there's some kind of evidence that that's how it works as well. In Star well, you're Trek, you're literally torn like... apart, changed into a computer <laughs> program, and then beamed somewhere else, and then put back together. Yeah, <laughs> and we've that... seen that that goes wrong. Yeah, I, think oh, the, the yeah, I would never the, get the, the transporter. I'm with McCoy on this. Don't do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess I guess like the two Rikers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or two Vix, or any other number of horrible accidents. Evil Kirk, good Kirk, like, yeah. 
I think there's like, enough evidence in the Star Trek world to be like, look, I don't think we should be using that thing. Well, I mean, it's, <laughs> I like, it's like too... a Yelp review, right? You only see the things that are bad. No one talks about all the times that everyone's transformed and everybody's fine. It's just like, yeah, we've got an evil dog and a good unicorn dog. <laughs> Like, that'd be a thing though, like because McCoy could like I imagine over a couple of Romulan and ale some nights though he might get into that with with Jim and Spock where he's just like you know because I've never been in one of those things, but you guys I don't know if I'm talking to the same Jim like you yeah. could you could have died five times today yeah you're Jim number two thousand six hundred eighty four. I was like yeah you you have all the memories of Jim Kirk but you're not you're not the guy I was speaking to this morning because that guy's dead because his yeah. his atoms were literally ripped <laughs> ripped apart and then reconfigured to come back together like you know you as an entity are are, are a new being and stuff. But it know? brings up the question, which is the fundamental question in this movie: is is the person who is created here actually the Joker or just some facsimile of the Joker? I say I vote facsimile. I vote facsimile I as well. Joker. I, I would say facsimile in that he is a bit different from um, – he's much more like uh, – in, in his performance, it's different. Like because Mark Hamill was specifically instructed to tone things down and to make yeah. it more somber and sinister and stuff instead of – like even this chunk, he's kind of back in his normal mode. But like the rest of the movie, he's you know, much more you know, kind of you know, uh, the disgrace to the name Joker. Like – Back in the day, he would have been much more like, ah, ha, ha, like all the time. around, setting thinking. things on fire. And <laughs> yeah, 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 like uh, me. Yeah. Except so it, that, that would indicate that it's a facsimile. But in the flashback, though, he is very similar to this Joker. So it's kind of like, yeah, I don't know if we're supposed to take it that it's literally like. The... I don't think it lit- It can literally be him. Mm. He's his own clone son. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. But I think he it's would call a... himself a fact silly me. Wait. That's the episode title right there. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Write that down. Um, I work something here we haven't actually got. <laughs> something we haven't got to yet is what he then does. Mm. He uh, he triggers a weapon of some kind, a laser. Yet again, there's a lot of lasers. A laser, going on in this. yeah. So, and he he <laughs> yes, and he begins to uh, choose a target. A military target? No. <laughs> and name the system. It's a um, <laughs> he's, uh, he's going to attack Stately Wayne Manor, followed by Terry's mom's house, which feels a bit like lower key. I love that it What's says that? on the map, mom's house. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say, too, that, um, well, one, I can't get past it, because every time I cut that shot, though, because you get the kind of big boy looking thing on the outside, the Jolly Jack of the Jolly Jack Candy Factory. Mm. And I keep thinking it's going to take off into space a la Austin Powers. I know. <laughs> like, <laughs> Joker I'm, would have a cat. Be- 100%. I thought he was literally going like, oh, that is the rocket. It's going to go up and that's the laser now. Or well, it whatever. looks like Bob's Big Boy or whatever the rocket was, I guess, in Austin Powers. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Apparently I that's always, a- I, and I could have Googled this over the years, but I don't want to ruin it almost. As a kid watching that here in England. I was thinking to myself the entire time, is that like a real thing in America? Is that a thing or have they made it up for the movie? Mm. And I've never looked it up. Well, apparently know, uh, Jack, the Jack and the Candy Jack is a uh, tribute to Jack Kirby. Hmm. Yeah. The, the so big... the Jolly Jack of the Jolly Jack. Yeah. I think you, you're talking about in Austin Powers, though, John. Oh, yeah. 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 It, 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 big, I, yeah. Bob's Big Boy is a real thing, I believe. Yeah. It Amazing. is. Amazing. And I know that it is because, again, not to go back to him, but apparently David Lynch would go in to Bob's Big Boy to have his breakfast every single day. For like, Apparently he has done for like decades. Like, Incredible. That's, his, that's his the fit. most Lynch thing ever. <laughs> yeah, because he, lo- he loves the name Bob as well. Yeah. So he's probably like, oh my God, this is my favorite place ever. <laughs> like, and he loves the 50s. I think <laughs> and a, it looks a bit 50s. There's a famous photo of him, young David Lynch and young John Waters standing next to the Bob's Big Boy statue, like that little figurine that I'm going like, here they are, meeting in like 19... 19- 78 or whatever incredible like, these, these two guys but like um yeah but the, the bob's big boy outside of the u.s though must know like yeah your your legacy is just austin powers now that's so, all i know it from yeah i yeah. think that's the only thing that exists to this day i think i don't think it exists anymore oh well, well it, it lives on in austin powers yeah. and that first one's a good one and again uh david Lynch gonna be devastated like, well what oh. do you mean it shut, <laughs> it shut down <laughs> Well, he's replaced it with telling you the weather every day. Well, I suppose he doesn't even do that anymore. Mm-hmm. He says, I'm just going to have to smoke even more <laughs> now if I can't get my Bob's Big Boy in the morning. Oh, um, bless him. But they, I, I did also notice, too, that the weird, like, terrifying-looking head thing that goes up into the other head of the Jolly Jack, uh, it actually has, like, a streamer 
sticking out of his mouth. Um, it looks like you know, it's like smoking a, a cigar almost. <laughs> but, but I, yeah, it looks I like it's smoking like, a firework. Yeah. Yeah. But I did wonder, like, when the candy factory was in full swing, like, that thing filled up with steam, and then once they knew the day was over, the streamer would go off. And uh, like, oh, like, <laughs> um, I could see it maybe being – I don't know if you, they, they had these in uh, America and Canada and stuff, but um, those sweets you used to get here now that were sold that looked like cigarettes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they also had ones that looked like matchsticks. We mm. had Popeye's um, candy cigarettes. Oh, there you go. Yeah. See, well, I mean, there was a bunch of branded here. ones. They, yeah. they still make them, but they call them candy sticks now. Candy sticks, yeah. Probably candy sticks. <laughs> I, I also, they don't they don't look like they're smoking paraphernalia. Yeah, they took a little red remember, end off it. <laughs> yeah, I also remember they they had um, bubble gum candy cigarettes, and it was like a bubble gum, <laughs> and it was wrapped in paper, but kind of loosely, and it had a power uh, powder in between the bubble gum and the wrapper. So if you blew out. It would blow up uh, a puff of like candy uh, dust. Well, there was also licorice uh, pipes, I think. <gasps> licorice yes, pipes. I've seen yeah, I, I mean, I hate licorice. I never ate one, but uh, I remember seeing them. Oh wait, no, I think because I think we talked about something. What was the thing I watched a couple of years ago? Because we, I, I, I hate licorice, and I think we talked about on. Um, like, was it during '89? Because we talked a lot about sweets. I think it was during Returns because of all the black goo coming out of uh, the penguin's mouth and all of a sudden it looked like he was eating a load of blackjacks and stuff. that was it the sweets blackjacks that you have here i don't know if you get them abroad but and i think there was a film i watched which was like an old thing from like the 50s or something and like some of the end was going around with a gun threatening people i think it was spencer tracy if i recall correctly mm. and then at the end he just turns the gun around and like puts it in his mouth and then take bites off oh, that things sounds and he's very like, familiar and he's like oh it's it's, li- it's a licorice gun Amazing! I'd eat licorice if it came in gun shape. Oh, I bet, I bet, I bet, I'm, I'm not going to Google it now because I don't want to take <laughs> the real thing. But, but I guarantee if we Google like licor- Spencer Tracy licorice gun, we'll get that in like five seconds. Incredible! But I also bet that 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 they're not allowed to make that now. No, no, no. I don't think that was oh. even. Well, I think maybe when I was a kid, you all still got it. But the concept of a licorice gun, though, to me is like because I hate licorice so much. It's like ugh, I ugh. do, but I'd be willing to put up with it for that. The movie is Adam's <laughs> Rib from 1949 with Spencer Tracy. Oh, Amazing. there we go. There Amazing. we go. And I think it's got Judy Holiday in it as well. Mm. He's like one of the big one of the big uh, influences on Harley Quinn as well. I love the way you say I think she's in it. It's you, Niall. Of yeah, course you're right. Oh you're God, always God. right. One hundred percent certain that Judy Holiday is in that You yeah. know you're right. We know you're right. Oh. Just accept it. But um oh speaking of really disgusting things though, um because like, I've never I've never like that. <laughs> he can hear I've you. never had them. Uh, but to hop back a bit earlier in the chunk. Um, cause when the, when Terry's talking about like when, not Terry, when Tim's talking about like that he can feel the Joker and he's like, I can, can feel, feel him, his presence. He's like, I can feel him writhing around in my stomach, like bad oysters. Ugh. I thought bad oysters uh, was an interesting choice. Yeah. It's like, why oysters? <laughs> cause oysters are so like, it's, it brings up such a disgusting image by itself. And then to be like bad oysters is like, ugh. Cause to me, like Don't bad like- oysters is something that like, if you have a bad oyster, like it literally kill you. It'd be like salmonella. Like, you would just oh. die. <laughs> Mm, mm. One of many reasons I'm a vegetarian. I don't want to get sick <laughs> off any of this stuff. God damn it. But you know what? Even when I ate meat and stuff, I've never eaten an oyster because they looked disgusting. I, I never have either. But um, And this could be verified by a um, friend of the show, uh, Rob Rob O'Connor, who might be listening to this at very episode. Hello, Rob, if you are. Uh, <laughs> but I visited him in Dublin a couple of weeks ago. But immediately prior, I've been listening to... An episode of some uh, an episode of some podcast that I never listened to before, uh, but it was it was weird. It's like these two women. I think one of them was the pop star Jessie Ware and her mm. mum, uh, and their their idea for the podcast is that they make dinner for the guests and then they sit and eat it on mic. So you're oh. constantly hearing the cutlery going and you're hearing like, oh, that sounds Whoa. like a nightmare. Oh. <laughs> no, yeah. that's horrible. Is that for weirdo creeps who get off to like ASMR and stuff? It could be. It could be because it <laughs> seems like so it's a, such a fundamental rule of podcasting is like don't eat on air. No. It's disgusting. No. I keep and eating then myself have, like, to drink. Never mind eat. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, like the fact that goes. thing. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. And then be like, oh, no, Jesse wears a big pop star. So she, she can pitch a podcast and now it's ma- she gets massive guests in and stuff. They're like, but yeah, one of them uh, they had on was the actress uh, Jessie Buckley from uh, you know I love Jessie Buckley because she's an Irish girl, um, mm. and uh, she's just a phenomenal actress in in general. 
but uh, yeah, she was talking. One of the questions for her were like, um, "What uh, what would be like your last meal if you could have one?" And her thing was like, "I like a dirty martini with uh, past- pasta parmesan and oysters." Ugh. And I had a thing in my head like, I just really want to have that though. I really want to have a dirty martini with some cheesy pasta. And then, but I, I, when I came to the oysters, it's like I can't do it. Because one, I'm I'm allergic to seafood anyway. I was gonna say, haven't you got problems with a lot of like fish? Yeah, yeah. So I couldn't touch it. But when I was over in Dublin, I was just like, I really want to go somewhere and get a dirty martini and then get like some pasta. And then Rob was like, I'll get you sorted. And we didn't get them together, but like we went, we went to the place, got a dirty martini, and then we went and got pasta. And he's like, I'll find your oysters. And I was like, I'm gonna have to stop you there, man. <laughs> <laughs> I might die. <laughs> you can have the oysters. Like, have I'm you, not did you it. intend on having a medical emergency tonight? Because that's how this is gonna end. <laughs> No, it but, could be like that episode of Broad City. As long as you know, you you just got to like ride the line a yeah. little bit. <laughs> yeah, just she's keep... puffing off like <laughs> she's she's she looks like she's about to die, but she's okay. She's okay. It's like this is what living on the edge looks like. <laughs> <laughs> well, the line reminded me strangely of Scrooge, because yeah. you know when Marley appears to, to Scrooge, he always he says like oh. he might be like a, a bit of cheese or undigested beef or potato or something yeah. along those lines. Oh, like a, an underdone potato. Yeah. So I know every t- every time now I, I'm mashing my spuds. <laughs> <laughs> and I can feel an underdone potato. I'm like, I'm getting rid of that in case I get visited by ghosts. You don't tonight. want like, visitations. You really don't. Yeah. Well, it's a crime in Ireland to uh, to eat that. Anyway. <laughs> You've got to cook them well. Yeah. Uh, Bubba, Bubba Wheat, have you, ever, have you ever imbibed on an oyster? Or are you, uh, are you no, really the one I, person to come in and go be like, oh, they're incredible. <laughs> I, I mean, I I like a lot of... Uh, you know asian buffets and stuff and they often have oysters but that's you know i i can be kind of uh you know, uh adventurous and and some of my food like I, i've tried octopus um and mm. squid but oysters for me is one step too far that just does not look appetizing to me i've had them no, cooked it... but i haven't had them like you know like the kind that's supposed to just slide down your throat like Oh no no no! no. But even it the, looks the, like snot. Uh, it probably <laughs> even feels using... like snot too, just like gooey and slippery and ew. yeah, yeah. But like oh, I've had God. escargot, like you know snails. Oh, they look awful oh, too. No. Although they're they're quite nice, but like uh, that was being made by my friend Coralie, who's properly from a proper French. She's not a chef, but she's French, so she's like, the most I, French person I've ever met. She is. She is literally the most French person you could. She's just so <laughs> outrageously French all the time. <laughs> Although um, I, I could, like, I could see this version of Tim Drake being someone that you know he's used, to, like he grew up in the the Wayne Manor for however many years, <gasps> and then he yeah. went on his own, and now he's you know middle class, but he still wants to. To eat fancy food every once in a while. Yeah, he's like, I want nothing to do with. I want nothing to do with that lifestyle except the oysters. Except that, yeah. like, Come every on. now and then he might get a, a cheeky little uh, tin of caviar. You yeah. know. But, but he, the wife, don't let like, the wife see the caviar. But he can't afford the good <laughs> stuff, so he gets the cheap stuff, and that, that makes him <laughs> <it> sick. <laughs> Is that saying to the wife, like, oh, let's go out for like a dirty martini and some oysters? And she's like, what, what do you <laughs> think I have? Jesse Buckley, oysters. get out of here. <laughs> yeah. oh, oh, God. That's oh. another thing. That's another thing that looks bad about them, right? Unless you're getting really high quality oysters and things, you're probably going to get sick. Mm. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's totally. a bit like I, when I used to live in uh, Pakistan, you were told, because where I lived, Islamabad, nowhere near the sea. Mm. So the rule was don't ever ever eat seafood i I believe it's not gonna you're gonna get ill you're gonna get ill but there was places selling it i think that because when i was going to dublin i was telling um friend of the show and frequent guests uh lauren ashley carter it's like oh i'm going over i'm really i've I've been listening i listened to this interview and now i really want this thing and she's like i won't touch oysters i'm like well it just looks disgusting and she's like no because i had bad ones and i was fucking destroyed for about a month (laughs) like just puking up uh as the as we would say in ireland puking up a ring uh, in, <laughs> in in work and everything. It was just, Jesus. It was apparently really, really, really severe. Yeah. Uh, so I was like, when seafood goes so wrong, reasons, it goes really wrong. Well, well then, not, and not, seafood is, is actually you know, highly counterfeited. It, you know, you, yeah. Yeah. you think you're getting one fish, but you're actually getting a much cheaper, uh, well, like a much crab. more likely to get like, you sick. Yeah, because <laughs> crab, like, really, but, like, what is usually advertised as crab is not crab at all. Mm. No. Very rarely, yeah. very, very rarely. I feel now like this episode has turned like the phrase, the phrase, the world's your oyster, 
it's given us an entirely ah. different meaning to me now because I'm like, ah. the world your oyster means like, yeah, you could risk Ooh. getting a really horrible yeah. illness. This world is a horrible, terrible place. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I'm not, I'm not um, preaching, but you know, join us on the vegetarian side, people. <laughs> it's very hard to get sick of veggie food. You can, but it's rare. Mm-hmm. Um, but anywho, uh, <laughs> where, where were we? Oh yeah, so oh yeah, so. Um, He's That's attacking uh, Terry's mum's house. He's, gonna attack Ter- he's, saying he's either going to go for the hospital, where uh, the, the, the darling Dana is, the Joker blowing up a hospital, of course, feature in the film The Dark Knight. Uh, Everything's uh, connected. But a mere eight years later. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and this is the weird bit where, like, yeah, Terry's mum is out pushing his little brother on a swing at, like, like 10 p.m. <laughs> like, it's, it's clearly pitch black out, but, like, this is the time you take the kid out to go on the swing. Well, she's a single um, mother. This is the time she has to spend with her child. Come on, let's not judge. That's, That's a good enough. point. Maybe she's only just got back That's from right. work. That's right. She dragged the poor kid out of, out of bed. She's like, we're going to the park. Yeah. I'm we're assuming... having a nice moment together, whether you want to or not. Yeah, I'm assuming it's like a community garden or something, because it's like, if that's Terry's garden, Jesus Christ, like, Bruce Wayne pays well, because, like, yeah. two swing sets. She doesn't need to no work way. if she's got, like, this huge roof ter- rooftop play park. <laughs> true, to be fair, true. too, like, if she is working... Like, Bruce should be really paying Terry a lot for being Batman. Like, I know he's, he has to do it on the thing. Of like, oh, yeah, he's my houseboy or whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah. He lives there and he pays him. But I, Terry ain't giving his mum anything. But it should be like, <laughs> Bruce should also be like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll doctor a few documents. And then, oh, it turns out, like, yeah, your husband left you, like, 25 million or whatever. Like, so you're not. You know, <laughs> or even just like, oh, but... Terry, you put the lottery on this week. Oh, you won. You won. Exactly. Oh, it's exactly. Wow. <laughs> I, I agree, but at the same time, I think historically Bruce has shown but he's a bit of a dick. He doesn't really care. <laughs> he doesn't really care, does he? He doesn't really care about other people, and I don't mean that in a nasty way. He doesn't think about them. I think his thing would be like, "Well, you know, st- struggle builds character, kid." Yeah, and then it'd be like, "But he, you he didn't have about the struggle." The city, but not the people. If that makes sense, <laughs> <laughs> and people would be like, "But Bruce, you didn't have the struggle. You grew up rich." Like, My parents are dead. You <laughs> asshole. Well, as a string <laughs> of God, wit- everyone's parents are dead. Get over it. As now. a string of love interests in the movie has, are often pointing out to various Bruce Waynes, he just likes to be miserable. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And he probably thinks other people. Everyone should be miserable. Should be miserable. <laughs> so let me contribute like to he- your misery. <laughs> he's like he's a, the spirit of a of someone from uh, northern England, Bruce Wayne. Just like, yes. just, just love, just love misery. Just can't we're really. all miserable up here. We yeah. are. It I never really, changes. I've just really discovered from now working in my new office, like work next to a girl, most, the most north. She's fantastic, lovely person, but she's the most northern attitude towards anything. She just <laughs> loves being miserable. Yeah, you just come <laughs> in on a Monday morning and you're just like, "How was your weekend? Oh, this triple it mill." Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was a good impression. <laughs> But it's just like every opportunity she has to like fix her situation to like no no leave it, it'll be fine. It's like but you're just miserable. Just do something about it. You don't understand it, Niall. You don't you don't get it. You're not from up here. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Um, but then actually talking about making people miserable though, because the Joker then comes out with this thing of like the reason he's targeting Dana and Terry's mum is like oh I think that it's you know it stands that every hero should have some defining element of tragedy in his backstory. Mm-hmm. And uh, so clearly the Joker has not watched the uh, the first two episodes of Batman Beyond because he knows <laughs> that Terry does have a defining tragedy in his backstory. His dad's dead. His dad was murdered by, uh, you know, Derek's powers people. And that was his whole motivation for becoming Batman was to yeah, avenge his father. Yeah, but when only one parent's dead, is it that bad? Mm. You know, <laughs> he's like, nah, you've got to be an orphan. That's why you've got two, you see? The so you spare. <laughs> yeah. But Bruce pops on Mike for a second. He's like, he, he is right though, Terry. Like, if you, I think you would be a better Batman if your mother was also dead. Like, so <laughs> we'll take her out of the equation. It'll be See, fine. If <laughs> his so dad like, had been killed while wearing pearls, so there could be a slow motion <laughs> shot of pearls falling onto a wet pavement, that would be tragic. I mean, he, he has like to murder his entire. He has <laughs> to murder his entire extended family, like the 2004 <laughs> Punisher movie. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great though if Bruce had a little mic. Like he can pop out of. Terry's suit like on a microphone and Joker's like would you rather Dana or Terry's mother and he's just like Bruce's voice comes out kill the mother <laughs> kill the mother <laughs> can I call- who's that Do who's it. that you can I phone a friend <laughs> <laughs> I, I also love uh, Joker's line where he goes like this to me 
is so perfect. He says, adios, Brucey. I guess I should salute you as a worthy adversary and all that. But the truth is, I really did hate your guts. <laughs> and the way he says it, it made me think of like, it's a line you'd hear from Blackadder. <laughs> to like, you know, when they're about to go to to war, you know, yeah. and he, he'd be saying it to uh, Baldrick. And that's a uh, that's a very telling line for this version of the character because now, in particular, in the modern parlance of the Joker, is that like he's basically like in love with Batman. Like mm. he's he's got a they've got such a connection that like he he can't you know you you complete me all this oh. business like I, yeah, but this... I think this one's like i'm just i'm just sick of you now <laughs> no i think that's that's the thing is like i think even back in the Ass era he would have been like oh we have our fun but i annoy batman and you know, i like winding him up but i really do want to kill him most of the time it's like every time he's trying to kill him he is genuinely trying to get rid of the guy oh, yeah. yeah it's not sort of like oh i'm just doing it for a laugh and then you know the game will go on again it's like and then, you know, the fact he's so frustrated when he th- the, guy, the man who killed Batman episode where they think that some random asshole, Sid the Squid, killed Batman. The Joker's outraged by the idea that he wasn't the one to do it and stuff. It's got to be the Joker doing it and he has to do it in a funny way. Exactly, exactly. It has to be, it has to go out. It's, it's his project is to kill Batman in the perfect manner, basically. Yeah. But the rest of the time he's like, oh, as a person, like I don't want to, like, the rest of my existence to be like, I'm just going after Batman. I'm just winding this guy up. He's like, I'm having my fun with it now, but I really do want to kill this guy <laughs> as well. Uh, and so, yeah, that is a, a thing. Of, you know, then just be like, just, you know, now we're not a brass sex. I'm, I am about to kill you. You should know. <laughs> that, like, you might have, you might have seen all the, you know, the various adaptations of Bat Media that have probably been made about our lives since we've, <laughs> since we've both been dead or whatever. Um, but oh yeah, in this universe, there'd be movies and everything. Oh yeah, there was a, in Batman Beyond. There's an episode where there's Batman the musical. T- Terry, oh, there you go. Yeah. Terry brings up Bruce to see a musical version of his own life, which is weird. <laughs> it's like uh, Avengers the musical, which was awful. Oh yeah. my god, I forgot all about it. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus uh, Christ. That, that, that episode is great, though, because it's Kevin Conroy as grumpy Bruce Wayne sitting going, oh my god, this is garbage. But also <laughs> Kevin Conroy doing the voice of the Batman on stage and oh, getting really? getting to sing this really campy, like, hey, superstitious, cowardly dog. <laughs> and you can tell he's just having the time of his life, you know? <laughs> so, um, Something else I was living for. Um, you alluded to it at the start of the episode there. Well, you didn't just allude to it. You, you straight up quoted it. Uh, the Joker asks Terry if he has any last words for the old bat fart, <laughs> which on one hand is terrible. Like, that's awful. Yeah. But on the other hand, I'm like, I kind of love it, though. It's, it's it, like good, bad, bad, yeah. good. I don't know. It is, of course, one of the uh, the many things they censored uh, was, uh, but honestly, Bubba, you'd be aware if you, did, if you did a whole thing in your blog about this. But uh, Susan, you might not know that originally when this was released, they like, heavily censored the film even changed the way the joker died and stuff oh yeah because of uh, uh, then, the uh, the columbine uh school shooting yeah very yeah. well, because every single plot point is incredibly messed yeah, up <laughs> that as well it's like, it's sort of like we, we, we covered it in the, the earlier chunks the kind of legend about it is that, that it was to do with columbine it was actually down to like a wb kids executive yeah it's like who like you can't uh, air this was, for kids there's like one guy who was just like i gave you a job I told you to make a straight to video kid friendly thing. What the hell is this? Like, so it was, mo- it was mostly just one guy's opinion. Yeah. That was well, like, no, no. I get it though. Like, I, I'm against censorship and I love the finished product, you know, this that we get. But if the task is to make a movie to put on the kids' channel or, or straight to video or whatever, you fail. This is Nick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it would be every time you come back, it's like, oh, you, what do you think? Oh, you can get away. No, you can't get away with it. I keep telling you to make a thing, and you're not making it. I mean, the scenes with Robin, like as as the mini as Jun- Joker Junior, are are disturbing. Oh, as yeah. an adult, oh, yeah. I can't yeah. imagine the nightmare fuel that would be for a child. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, and one of the many things, like um, I think we did get to the. I think Audra finally answered why they changed. They changed uh, putts to yuts and the things like that. We're like, wow, they're really getting into the censorship. And uh, yeah, bat bat fart was taken out. Uh, replaced oh, with come the, on. You can say fart. That's not swear. Well, also because it's it a, follows a long-standing bat tradition where you put bat in front of something, you know, like for, you know, same yeah. bat time, same bat channel. Instead of old fart, it's old bat fart, you know. Oh, they changed they change it to uh, the old bat coot. Uh, that sounds worse. That sounds dirtier somehow. <laughs> yeah, I don't like that at all. <laughs> that might have been why they changed that. They're like, oh, we changed it to the old bat, the old bat codger, uh, the old bat coot. 
oh, that almost sounds worse than fart. Like, yeah, let's go, let's go see if we can get that one. Oh, they also had to no. change uh, when he morphs into the Joker. Uh, they had to change him saying, it's a killer, uh, into it's a doozy. Uh, but I think that's okay, a, okay. I think that's one of the things. To be fair, both lines work totally fine. It, yeah, you know, I have no problem with the. I'd rather they didn't censor it, but if they're gonna, at least they picked something that sounds yeah, okay. Yeah, I think there's a thing like I I noted that like way back when when I even I was a kid, a lot of cartoons wouldn't say the word kill or death or anything like that. They'd have yes. to dodge around it. So there's a lot of websites like, that oh, won't do it now. Like you, you have to put like uh un 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 live you or something like know. that. Oh yeah, yeah, on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, you can't mention suicide. I always have to say to unalive. Yeah, unalive. You can't like say murder yeah. either. You just, you know, say unalive. It's just like that, that's why that's now become a phrase for kill. Yeah, to unalive People someone. Say it, yeah, unalive. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Although that's, that's that's how Demolition Man was getting so wrong, though, where like every time someone gets murdered, they have to call it a murder death kill. But Stern's like, no, the actual future, you can't say murder at all. The, the, the future's even worse. <laughs> you can't say murder, death, or kill. You have to you have to call it like, oh, the, he unalived him. <laughs> and then the thing's I down the line. I can see that being the line in Demolition Man. The thing's down the line, though. Eventually, that'll become like if you don't want to trigger people with something, change it to this word. Eventually, people will get triggered by that as well. Yeah. So you'll have to change it to something else. So it's kind of like, you know, well, language the word is always so- evolving anyway. Yeah, I guess that's yeah, true. Exactly. I guess that's true. But it's which is why, on one hand, I don't mind. You know, I'm like, okay, fine, fine. But I just hate the the way. It, I, do, I just don't want things like TikTok to help people change their language. <laughs> <laughs> I'm old. I'm old. I can't go on TikTok. I've tried. I think, it's weird. I think, yeah. I mean, I'm of a generation where they would air like you know, the the easiest way to see big blockbuster movies was when they finally appeared on TV. So I remember mm-hmm. once just catching Die Hard on TV. Oh, yeah. And there's a lot of swearing in Die Hard, which I am perfectly fine with. I have a... Well, his catchphrase. Uh, yeah. Right? But they dub over the swears. They don't beep them. <laughs> it was awful. I'm sure this exists on YouTube. You go and you see, watch the overdubbed version because it's like... I can't even remember. It was like you know, drat instead of damn. Because and I think the the, the, the fa- I think the big famous one for Die Hard was Yippee Kaye, Mister Falcon. Something along those lines, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is crazy. And then the the big the really famous one because it's so badly dubbed as well as in Snakes on a Plane. Yeah. <laughs> and changing, I've had it. Uh, I've had it up to here with these motherfucking snakes on this motherfucking plane has changed to, I've had it up to here with these. Monkey fighting snakes on this Monday to Friday plane, ah, <laughs> which is just like, like they know it's funny. <laughs> oh no, I think at that point they're like, "What else are we going to do?" If you're going to do it, lean into it, right? <laughs> yeah. That's great. There are two oh. things in this minute that uh, this chunks of minutes uh, that made me laugh. The first is, and it's a very serious set of minutes, but um, Tim Drake has this huge breakdown of like his you know trauma and everything like that. And then Terry's reply is, I'm going to call you an ambulance. <laughs> Which I found exceptionally funny. And the second one is um, when the Joker is typing away on his computer, uh, the, all the code on his computer is just the alphabet. <laughs> oh, my God. I didn't even pick up on that. Oh, you're oh, right. <laughs> What? <laughs> like the idea that yeah, the, Terry doesn't have any uh, sensitivity training. No, he's just like, <laughs> so, I'm going to let someone else deal with this. I'm calling an like, ambulance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think even Bruce Wayne back back in the BTAS era would have been like, he'd go over and like put his hand on people's shoulders. And Bruce would attempt to comfort people despite how dark and brooding he was. Mm. Like, you know. Uh, but yeah, Terry's just like, I'm 17, man. I can't deal with your crap. Yeah. Like, I'm, like, I'm, nah. That's not fair to expect a 17-year-old to, you know? The whole thing is not fair to you expect Terry, them, really. You <laughs> expect them to save the entire city, but this is unfair. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. I mean, as, we, as we've seen, you know, in episodes and stuff, he's he's finding it hard. He's trying to have a relationship with this this girl, and he's falling asleep at the dance club. Can yeah, I just say something Bruce's... that annoyed me about that? There's a couple of things that annoyed me about his girlfriend, Dana. First of all, she's a stereotype. Does she sleep at that club? Is that the only place she's ever been? <laughs> oh yeah, that's the only place he <laughs> yeah. meets her. Yeah. And second of all, I'm really annoyed that uh, t- uh, that uh, Bruce has a great Dane, and his girlfriend Terry's girlfriend's name is Dana. Oh, <gasps> oh. wow! My gosh. Are you trying to tell us something? Are you calling her a dog? How Someone is apparently. Wait, <laughs> <laughs> but like. Bruce trying to like go one to one with Terry one time like I know how you feel kid you have your Dana I have my Great Dane like we're we're the same we're the same, we're just, <laughs> that's the same. <laughs> it is the same but as someone who has trouble with names in general in real life 
the fact that they're named Terry and Tim, I find very confusing. I can never remember which. I've actually written down in my notes who is who. Oh, no, I, I'm so glad you said that because I have the same problem when I'm taking my <laughs> yeah. notes. He's like, Terry, no, Tim, 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 Terry, Timmy, Terry. Like Susan sitting with like the um, like <laughs> Lenny White Carl Black on her, on her hands. This is like <laughs> Tim, Tim White, Terry Black hair. Me, I, mean, I don't know my left or my right either, so I have to do like the L thing with my yeah. left hand. But oh. it's just like yeah, on the palm of my hand, I'd be just like, Tim is broken. <laughs> Terry is <I've>... pointy-eared. <laughs> I know I the feel uh, pain, ADHD. <laughs> that's the thing I only found out in a uh, in adult adult life where someone mentioned uh, when they were a kid, they learned left from right by if you hold up your left hand yes. and your finger Palm finger out. pointing up and your thumb yeah. pointing up, and it's like that makes an L makes an for L, left, and that's left. And like yeah, and I I did I was like oh is that how you learn? I was like yeah, that's how I learned that. And I was like I never knew that was a thing. Like I was like oh well yeah, no, that's an incredibly handy well, way it's to clearly learn. Clearly because you right. know your left from your right. <laughs> 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 oh but uh but yeah yeah we're we're essentially at the end of the chunk here uh gotham once again in uh danger at the hands of the joker but hey what's new uh, <laughs> and again with another fight club you know we hinted at it earlier that he's got the uh uh-huh. the path of the labor laser and a smiley face Oh yes, yeah, yeah. it's incredible that I love it. That's a very Joker move. Yeah, I, do, I also I, I, like I, I, the, the trivia. You probably covered it whenever the the laser first appeared, but uh, I I love the fact that the trivia that I read that's the uh, the animator that worked on the laser is the same person that worked on the animation for the laser in the suborbital laser in Akira. Yeah, yeah. What, I didn't know before we started doing this, and when we did it, it, it all made sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They kind of brought him over and be like, oh, "Outdo yourself." He's like, "Oh, great!" And then they're like, "Yeah, here's like half the money you had for a <laughs> 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 uh, I do appreciate too, and yeah, the smiley face. Um, like they, because Joker's kind of gone out of his way to make it a smiley face. I thought it would have been a bit too cheesy. Had all those points just coincidentally made up a smiley face, but it's like no Wayne Manor is up there, and then oh there kind of and it's like I turn the map that way, and then I draw a circle around it, and then put a smile that has nothing to do with anything underneath. Then it makes a smiley face, uh, where it could it could they could have really leaned into it, been like yeah they coincidentally those people those places on a map just happen to make up a smiley face. Is it ain't that wild, you know? No, he, he's done it because in 1991, 1992, he was an old raver. <laughs> He used to hit. He used to go down with the prodigy and everything, you know. Yeah, he's just down there in the hacienda in Manchester. Every yeah. just, you know, the Raven is that Raven is knocking off, you know. <laughs> it's maybe the obsessive uh, compulsive side of me, but it really annoys me that Mom's house covers the end of the smile. Oh yeah, yeah. It's like, oh that's gonna bug me now. You I'm mentioned sorry. it. God damn sorry, it. Don't. <laughs> that's always one of my big my big things. It's still the, the scar is never healed from uh, from childhood, but I just remember when like. You know, teachers at the blackboard in school, and they'd rub things out, and then there'd be like the edges of letters and stuff would still oh, be like, no. Oh no, you're the like, entire just, board. It's like, it's, <laughs> just go over and fix it. Just go like I can't concentrate on what you're saying because all I'm looking at is that thing. Just go over and fix it. You know? You're like miss, miss, you have to fix that. No one here is paying attention. They're only looking at that little bit of S that's left on the board. <laughs> and like two days later, it's still there. It's like if you still not clean that, what are you doing? Like I will clean this board listeners. for you. <laughs> Younger listeners won't get it. They don't have them anymore. Oh, yeah, that's true. Like magic that's true. boards and whatever's now. Kids today, the they don't know. They don't know the struggles <laughs> we went through. Uphill both uh, ways. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm all I'm all chunked out for the, these minutes. <laughs> Has anyone you had any chunks again? <laughs> we have blown them. I've blown my chunks. Has anyone got any uh, final chunks to blow at uh, <laughs> Batman Beyond: <laughs> Return of the Joker uh, before we before we pack on up? The only other thing that I found funny was that uh, Tim has this huge breakdown, and then he just uh, he says, "I'm going to call you an ambulance," and he just says, he just like straightens up and says, "I'm perfectly fine." <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you ain't. He's also like, because he's, you know, again, he's in America. He's just like, oh, I'm not paying for that. Sorry to make fun of you, America, but come on. <laughs> you can't afford a breakdown. Pull it together. <laughs> well, if you have nothing, Bubba Wheat, do you have anything? No, I think I'm good. All good, all good. We will then depart. Into the dark, dark night to go raving 
me, me and Niall are going raving with the Joker in a field. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, you got to do it in a field, apparently. Uh, before we do head off, though, would our wonderful guests like to promote their work or, or promote anything you like, actually? You could promote something unconnected to you that you just like. Uh, well, if anyone wants to hear a little bit more of me, they can go over to the One Armed Minute, which is the movie by minute ver- uh, podcast for The Fugitive, the 1993 action thriller classic. Mm. Uh, you can find us on Facebook at Tempest Fugitive, the One Armed Minute search team. We're also working up a new project for some time in the new year, so stay tuned for that. Mm. Oh, I'm intrigued. Listeners, I'm not pretending, by the way. I'm genuinely intrigued. I don't know. <laughs> Is it going to be Tommy Lee Jones based? Because we, we spent a lot of time on Tommy Lee Jones. <laughs> like I'm, I'm always happy to hear more I about I may it. have a mild obsession with Tommy Lee Jones, but no, it's not uh, Tommy Lee Jones based. No. Ah, uh, he would have been okay. a good, because like, everyone always goes on about, like, if you're doing Batman Beyond or, like, Dark Knight Returns, and it's like, oh, yeah, Clint Eastwood is Batman or bring back Heaton to do it. But, like, he wasn't a great Two Face. Like, he was good for what he was doing, but it was a complete misconception of what, how he should have played that character. Yeah, but that wasn't his fault. Well, well yeah. Um, I'd, I'd blame everything else. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, uh, Tommy Lee Jones is old man Bruce Wayne is a thing that no the people aren't touching on. It's like, that could have been really something. Well, if you, Him. Grumpy Bruce. If you yeah. really want to yeah. green into cranky Bruce, you just look no further. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, but yeah, you, I, I could totally imagine that guy's like, yeah, this is you know him, him in the cave on the having no time, not sanctioning Terry's buffoonery over the <laughs> over the mic. And, and Terry is such a buffoon as well. It's like a movie, a dream made a, a, a dream match. <laughs> Bruce, the Joker's really chat. Bruce, the Joker's chat. I don't care. <laughs> Reading the newspaper and uh, looking over it with a disapproving <gasps> look in the back. <laughs> cave. Yes. Oh, I can picture it. Oh my god, yes. <laughs> That'd be incredible. incredible. He could have his like glasses down at the end of his yeah. nose as well, always looking over it. I'm still getting over um, one of our previous guests, uh, Neil Rickardson, a couple of weeks ago, was telling us that he was considering um, writing. Was it, he's going to write a play about the, the making of Batman Forever. Mm-hmm. And he was just going to call it Sanctioned Buffoonery. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> I mean, that's the name of his episode right there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, other way I'm saying that, by the time you hear that episode, it might have been called something else. No, I think it has yet to come out as the time of recording, so I can make a note to call it back <laughs> when, when, when we get there. Well, um, Bubba Wheat as well, what, what have you got to promote? Uh, well, I will be done with Fight Club Minute. You can listen to all of that. And I have over at uh, rabbitholepodcast.com, and uh, I should be uh, working. I... I believe I'll have uh, some episodes out for the new season of my other podcast, uh, It's Time to Rewind, where I look at time loop movies and TV shows. Uh, Mm. I break those down one loop at a time. And uh, starting here in October, I'm going to be doing a season on uh, British sci-fi and (gasps) focusing on Red Dwarf and Doctor Who. (gasps) Oh. And, um, oh my god, I'm a Red Dwarf fanatic. I love Red Dwarf. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I grew, grew up Megan a Red Dwarf. Wright. Yeah, and, and I'm <laughs> kind of a person, but I'm a dwarfer. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm doing a sampling of uh, of both of those series, kind of uh, doing one episode or arc per Doctor and, and one episode per series of Red Dwarf. I believe and I signed up a, for a Red Dwarf episode. Yes, yes, you have. I've got you down. <laughs> and uh, I, it's going to be cum- culminating in the surprisingly the only Groundhog Day style episode of either of those shows with uh, the Jodie Whittaker Eve of the Daleks and I'll be breaking that episode down into each of its nine loops so that'll be kind of the the nine the nine episode climax and then I've got a few uh, spin-offs and and a couple others there's like Sapphire and Steel is another Mm. one that I'll be looking at a couple episodes of after I finish the uh, Red Dwarf and Doctor Who would have it all. Mm. So that should be fun. I did a full Red Dwarf rewatch last fall, and I've kind of dipped my toes into Doctor Who, but uh, I'm looking forward to, to, you know, I've liked what I've seen, and this is kind of an excuse to dig deeper into it. So that'll be fun. I get that. I know that that, that uh, Jodie Whittaker episode also fe- features Arlen's own Ashley B as well. <laughs> like, oh, I love Ashley B. 
Yeah. So it's every time I, I, like, I'm, I'm slowly morphing into my dad. So every time an Irish person pops up in anything, I have to be like, hey, uh, there, there they are. And you're like, oh, it's a cell. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I remember that being a really good episode because I was during a particular kind of low point of Doctor Who. And then that episode came and I was like, oh. That was really good. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> so, yeah, that was actually yeah. the very first episode of Doctor Who I ever watched. Oh, well, nice. Yeah. That's a good one to go. A good one to start with, really. Because uh, I, mean, I, I, I will get you prepared. Uh, that's essentially what this, watching the show is like. You'll see something that's amazing, and then have to sit through six episodes of absolute crap, <laughs> and then you'll get to like another one that's that good that you're like, oh, I'm sticking with this, and then you know, <laughs> then you you never know what you're gonna get. This it's- is why I never got into it. I don't care if it's an institution over here. I, I it some stuff's great, and then you're like, oh, yeah, the, 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 the ones that are good, the ones that are good are that good that you're like, oh no, I'll I'll I'll, I'll, watch, I'll watch this yeah, just in case something of this caliber you get comes. Get the really yeah. great episodes. Yeah, I yeah. suppose you could say the same about later, later Red Dwarf though. Oh, yeah. Well, they're making think, a yeah, new one as well, aren't they? Yeah, they're yeah. coming I, I, in October. Yeah, yeah. We'll I think I, I, I clicked out of Red Dwarf when that when the Red Dwarf came back and they were all in prison. Loads of people did. I liked it, but yeah. no one else did. I think I watched that season and then after that I kind of lost track for a while and I was just like, but yeah, again, I, the first the first like five or six seasons I was like glue like no like the back of my hand, you know. But uh, yeah, I, I yeah, didn't like the time. Nanobot episodes or or the prison episodes, but I I liked the ones after that. I, I'm I feel like I'm one of the few people to like the Back to Earth special as well. It, it's okay. It, I think the problem with it, it for us especially, it breaks the, the fourth wall too much when it goes to the set of the soap opera he works yeah. on in real life. Mm. And it's like, this is this is slightly too far, because that, just that shot of the soap, it's like, that's an iconic shot to us of like, ah, yeah, <laughs> I've seen this 80,000 times. This is breaking it slightly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like the idea, but <laughs> mm. oh. I like all the Blade Runner references in it. But, um... But I'm sure you'll get to all of that. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, that's all to come in October, I guess. Yes. And uh, we we will get out of here now, listeners. You can join us again in one week. Uh, in the meantime, talk to us on Facebook at the Bat Minute Listeners Cave, on Twitter, X or whatever, at Bat Minute, Instagram, The Bat Minute, and find our network, Sleepy Charlie Media, on Patreon for bonus content and T Public for merchandise. So, yes. See you in one week for more chunky, chunky action, Batmites.